So I had an idea that I wanted to pass by you. Okay. So I just had this idea. I wanted to, I think it's really original. I don't think anybody's thought of this before. Okay. So you, you're with me? Yeah. So it's, it's a podcast, right? Yeah. And it's hosted by two white guys. Yeah. That's it. I never would have thought of that. Yeah. Uh, I don't think, I don't think any, you think anybody's ever done that before? Can't it be? There's no way. Just a couple of white guys hosting a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is the Alexander Society, aka Two White Guys with a Podcast. We are the podcast where we talk about history and we drink a lot because history is depressing. That it is, comrade. Tim, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Tim. I'm Derek's buddy. We used to go drinking a lot, and Derek would talk history to me when it happened. He'd give these little mini lectures, so we decided, why not make it a podcast? Yeah, and I'm Derek. I thought about becoming a teacher or a professor or something, and then I figured, well, I could spend tens of thousands of dollars on a bunch of degrees, or I could just make a podcast, and people would take me just as seriously. So, What are you drinking tonight, bud? I am drinking. I I actually came prepared this time. I actually went on a booze run. Thank you for reminding me, Tim. Yes, because I had to remind you how many times that day about that? (laughs) You had to remind me several times. Today, I'm going to be shooting... Oh, this... Oh, my God. This stuff is so good. uh, But yeah, I'm drinking plantation pineapple rum. You can't actually taste the pineapple, but it's still a really... Honest to God, this stuff is going to make me an alcoholic. It's so good. Again? Again, yeah. Uh, And then for drinking, uh, I just found like a cheap German beer in the liquor store I went to. It's called uh, Franzis Connor. It's like a light beer. Uh, I haven't tried it yet. Don't know if it's any good. The bottle's pretty cheap looking, so I'm not holding out hope, but we'll see. We will. Uh, Tonight, I am drinking Crown regal apple i don't know why they had to go with regal it's it's an apple and it's crown but my beer tonight is gonna be an oklahoma local from prairie ales it is millennial mansion i didn't even know the name when i picked it out i just know they do a lot of sours so i picked a couple other sours out for the next couple episodes right anyways here's our drinking rolls rule number one shot at the start of the episode let's go ahead and do that cheers that is much smoother than I remember. God, this stuff is so good. Rule number two. If there's an event in the story where someone died, take a sip. Mm-hmm. Yep, and it doesn't matter how many people die. One event where somebody, at least one person dies, take a sip. Rule number three. If we mention someone who is in a previous topic... In a future episode, we take a drink. Rule number four, if alcohol is mentioned, we take a sip. And rule number five, if there is an event in the script where someone dies and alcohol is involved, we take a whole shot. Because that's how we cope. Because that's how we cope. Yeah, so uh, when we left off, Alexander had just defeated the Persian king Darius in battle for the second time at the Battle of Gagamela. Uh, Gagamela is generally considered to be one of the most brilliant military victories in human history. And once again, Alexander had scattered the remnants of both the Persian army and the Persian government to the wind. Persia was in an awful position at this point. I mean, it sure sounds like it. He just absolutely destroyed its uh, ruling class. Yeah, as as a spoiler, um, there's not going to be another battle between Alexander and Darius. This was the last one. So <laughs> before we get into the Macedonian's journey from here, um, I'm going to talk about a little bit of what was on Alexander's mind, because a lot of this, this is the from moving forward from this point is when we get to some of like the really dark stuff. Oh, we're just now getting dark. Yeah, up to this. Well, from Alexander's perspective. Uh, he, he was on a roll up to this point, but from this point forward, he's going to be getting more and more setbacks and, uh, everybody is going to pay for it. Uh, to this point, Alexander had been kind of justifying his conquest by claiming that this was like a war of liberation, that these cities that he was 
occupying were being freed from the yoke of Persian oppression. As one does when trying to overthrow governments, you blame it on the people you're overthrowing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the people of Asia Minor, they didn't really care who their overlord was as long as stuff didn't really change, which Alexander pretty much gave them. Egypt, and as we're about to see, Mesopotamia, they both earnestly accepted Alexander as an actual liberator because both of them had a long tradition of independence and a deep hatred for the Persians. The Phoenician coast, of course, required a bit more terror, uh, to say the least, but at the very least, um, they were trading out one foreign emperor for another at the end of the day. So besides a couple burned cities, like not much was changing for the Phoenicians. But going forward from here, Alexander is walking into Persia itself. He's going into not just the, like he was in the Persian Empire at this point. Now he's going into actually Persia. Okay. So if he wanted the Persians to be subjugated, he'd need to take a different tact. He couldn't use the whole I'm liberating you from the Persian Empire line because now he's dealing with actual Persians. He can't be liberating them from themselves. So he realized that to bring the Persians into line, he'd have to convince them that he was Darius's rightful successor. He had to convince them that he was the rightful uh, king of kings. And in order to do that, he would have to play the part. So he'd have to start dressing like a Persian king. He'd have to start acting like a Persian king. And he'd have to most notably start taking on all of the ceremony and all of the tradition that went along with the title of the Persian king. Isn't that just what he wanted all along anyway, is all the ceremony? Yeah, it is. Uh, he Well, he didn't really care about the ceremony. He just wanted the conquest. But now he understood that to preserve his conquest and to be actually be recognized as the Persian king, he would have to act Persian. And he was willing to do that. But as we're going to see, it's going to cause a lot of problems with his army who, again, saw Persians as barbaric and inferior. Well, yeah, if you spend your whole life villainizing someone, then see your leader, not a person, but a specific set of people, then see your leader take on those traits right as you're about to take them down. That's that's going to mess with you. Yeah, it's you've spent this entire time like trying to kill these people. And then right as you're at the at the verge of winning, you see your literal like God King start to start to like act like them, start start to be them. It's going to cause, like I said, going to cause a lot of problems. Oh, I can imagine. So with that in mind, he made his way south along the Tigris River towards Babylon. Remember, he was at Gagamela. He was a ways north of Babylon along the Tigris, or yeah, the Tigris River. On his way down, he stopped in a city called Menes. And I I wanted to, nothing important happened at Menes, but I wanted to talk about this because it's kind of interesting. When he, while he was stopped over in Menes, there was, so near Menace, there is a natural petroleum well. So there's literally a place in the ground where you could go and just scoop up like a cup full of like petroleum oil. Oh, damn. Yeah. And like back in the ancient world, this was completely useless. Nobody had a, had a use for it. So what, why were they over there then? Um, they, they were just stopping in on this city on the way down to Babylon. But while he was, while they were in Babylon, some of the locals in Menace wanted to impress Alexander. And so while he was sleeping one night, they, they took a bunch of this oil and they poured it in a line along the causeway leading up to the building where he was sleeping. And then they went to his guards and they called and they asked Alexander to step out and come out into the street. Okay. And so he did. And when he came out, uh, they set fire to this line of oil so that the entire street lit, lit up. <laughs> that sounds like a threat. Um, they, yeah, they were just, they were just trying to impress. Like they were trying to be like, Hey, look what we can do. <laughs> we, we can make a controlled fire to light up this entire causeway. I thought it was funny because it's a lot of people don't think about, about oil, like in the ancient world, but it was, it was there and it existed. And like ancient people knew about it even before we had a use for it. So I, th I thought that was funny. I decided to throw that in there. I would have never made the connection. I didn't even realize it was like, I figured oil had been around. I just didn't know if like, you know, most of the time it's below ground. I didn't think they could dig that far. And I also do know that there are some deposits that are fairly close. I just never thought of it when thinking about that. Yeah. Yeah. And this one, it was just, it was just like, it's a pond of oil, like a small deposit that was right at the surface. Um, anyways, so after that, they arrived at the gates of Babylon and he had his army in battle formation because he was expecting 
he didn't know whether or not he would have to besiege Babylon in order to bring it down. And so he arrived with his army all set up for a siege. But as soon as they arrived, uh, Alexander, just like in Egypt, he was welcomed like a king. Uh, they brought out like bands. They had loud trumpets playing. All of the streets in the city were like adorned with flowers and garlands. They brought out a chariot uh, with four horses um, that brought him into the city. All of the people of Babylon were out in the streets like cheering him and praising him as their savior and all of this. The reason for that was because Babylon, like I said, they hated the Persians almost as much as the Egyptians did. And for pretty much like the same reasons. So Babylon had an ancient history of independence and even a couple of their own empires. So they had a long history in this region of like being one of the power players and they still kind of resented being under Persian rule. I mean, I, you can't really blame them to be honest. Yeah. That, that's something you see a lot in the ancient world. If one, if one place is an empire and then they get conquered by another empire, they're usually, usually like the biggest like problem areas for the new empire the ones that the place where they see like the most revolts and the resistance to their rule and things like that. Babylon had revolted in four against the Persians in 482 BCE. And as punishment, the Persians had torn down the temple to their God. The God of the city of Babylon was called Marduk. They tore down the temple of Marduk, which was housed at the top of a 300 foot tall ziggurat or like a pyramid. I have never heard that word ziggurat. Yeah, it's you know mostly see it associated with uh, like temple pyramids that were used in like the Middle East, like the ancient Middle East. I've seen them sometimes used to describe like the pyramids in Mesoamerica, like the old Aztec and Mayan pyramids. Yeah, they're called ziggurats. And this this the ziggurat of Marduk was the culturally the most important site in all of the city of Babylon. It was the most important thing to them. And a big part of why Alexander had been so warmly welcomed to the city was because ahead of time, he had promised to rebuild that ziggurat and the temple. Did he ever end up doing that? Oh, yeah. He got to work on it almost immediately. Interesting. He immediately gave them the funds they needed to rebuild it. And by the time he was done with his conquests, uh, it was pretty much almost done. Also, while he was in the city, uh, he started taking an interest in like Babylonian religious practices. And he started carrying out like ceremonies and sacrifices to the god Marduk, which he would kind of do on and off for the rest of his life. Uh, that kind of became like a big thing to him is alongside all of the Greek gods um, and to Amon Zeus, the Egyptian pseudo Egyptian Greek god thing. Um, he also started doing uh, sacrifices to Marduk as well. So did he have any like, how did he reconcile all the beliefs? Did he just believe them all? What, what was up there? Um, they weren't really incompatible because back in back then, like with uh, like ancient pagan religions, they didn't really have a conception of a god as like a universal power. It was more like a regional power. Like the Greeks believed that their gods were housed like on Mount Olympus, which was just right there in Greece with them. And so they they didn't see it as inconceivable that other gods could exist. And they regularly would incorporate like different gods into their own beliefs and that that happened all over the place it it wasn't out of the question to believe that somebody else's gods existed like amon zeus is a really good example amun ra being like a thoroughly egyptian god that was readily accepted by the greeks and kind of just incorporated into their own beliefs so there, there's definitely precedent for this but at the same time it is an eastern god and so it's kind of more proof that Alexander is kind of becoming more Easternized, which, you know, is kind of taboo for Greeks. And like I said, it's going to start causing problems. Up to this point, he had kind of only been. And the, the, the big thing with Mark, like the worship of Marduk is like with Amun, like with Amon Zeus, it was different because that God, even though it was Egyptian, it was already accepted by like Greek society. This is the first time he's actually demonstrating like like an affinity and sacrificing to a genuinely thoroughly Eastern God, uh, a God that um, no Greek had ever had any affiliation with before. And so that's that's it's one of those like first big things that's starting to set off alarm bells in his troops minds. I'm sure. Besides that, some other problems that Alexander's starting ha to have with his troops is that in a lot of ways, they already consider the conquest of Persia to be kind of done at this point. 
um, they're already starting to make plans for what they're going to be doing with all their wealth when they get back home. Um, while they're in Babylon, um, the Babylonian people were showering uh, Alexander's troops with all of the food and liquor and women that they could take. Also drink, by the way. Cheers. So put yourself into like the mind of one of Alexander's troops at this point. Oh, I'd be pissed. Yeah, they're they're basically like, well, we've defeated Darius twice, and now we're basically in paradise. So the ca- campaign's got to be basically over at this point, right? Yeah. And so Alexander literally had to bribe his troops just to get them to leave the city. Like he had to give them like these enormous bonuses just to convince them to keep going. <laughs> and then a little while after they left the city, um, they got some reinforcements from Greece. They got about 10,000 extra troops. Oh, goodness. And so he, Alexander decided to take the opportunity to go ahead and reorganize his command structure. So he reorganized it. So, But up to this point, all of his units had been separated by like where they were from. And so he started to kind of throw them in together so that they wouldn't have any sense of like united identity that was separate from like Alexander's leadership. I don't think that worked well for him, did it? It it worked fine for a time. It it wasn't the big thing that caused some of the problems we're going to see down the line. This was like a good sort of stopgap. Okay. And in addition to that, he also changed the policy up to this point. A commander of a particular division of his army would be decided based on seniority, but he changed it so that he it would be up to personal appointment by him. And so that gave him more power and control over his subcommanders, which in extension gave him more power over his troops. How well did that go over the changing of the line of like leadership? It caused some problems with his upper commanders, like his all of his immediate subordinates, like Parmenio and oh, what was his name? Another guy. We're going to talk about him soon. The, it really wasn't the big thing that was on their mind at this point. The big thing that was, that was on their mind was why are we still going? And why is it like yeah, I could imagine, like, every way you could think of, you are basically achieved your goal. Why keep going? Yeah, and so they were kind of like, well, why Why are we still going, and why is my thoroughly Greek king now dressing up like a Persian? Those were the big things. Um, so, with all that done, they set out properly from Babylon, and they headed east, and now we're actually getting into Persia. Now we are actually in, like, what's now modern-day Iran, actual Persia. Uh, they set off towards the city of Susa in November of 331, Susa being one of the largest cities in Persia, and it was sort of like a second capital of the Persian Empire. The city surrendered before Alexander even arrived. Like, they knew they knew what was about to happen. They're like, okay, well, we'll go ahead and give in. I mean, you can't really blame them with what they've seen so far throughout Alexander's campaign. Did they really even have a chance? No, they were. they didn't really have, like, like this is just, like, a month after like a month or two months after the Battle of Gagamela. So like they they knew that if they tried to resist, they weren't getting any reinforcements. They were all going to die. So so on his arrival, he was given another royal welcome and was basically handed the keys to the royal vault. The treasure from the royal keep in Susa basically doubled Alexander's wealth. Oh, dang. So he's, he's really doing good on money. Yeah, he was already ridiculous, like one of the wealthiest people in the known world. This doubled his wealth in an instant. Literally tons and tons of gold and silver and pur- like purple linens and artwork. It was interesting. Some of the treasures that he found in Susa were actually stuff that had been looted from Greece during the Persian invasions a century before. Oh, interesting. So he got some cultural history. But look. Yeah. Yeah, he'd actually end up sending a lot of that artwork back to like Athens in order to kind of quell them a little bit, because he was he was still kind of afraid about like a an uprising back home in Greece, kind of. And so he figured, well, try and tie up some of that. Um, he went ahead and sent some of that artwork back to Athens, which was, for what it's worth, like genuinely appreciated by the Athenians, even though they saw, saw that it was like just a shallow political move. But he was only doing it so because he felt like he had to. While he was in Susa... He took the opportunity for a good piece of propaganda. This this story is so funny. Oh, really? So in the Persian tradition, if you sit on the king's throne, okay, 
it was seen as an attempt to usurp the king's title and you would immediately be put to death. So in, in Persia, nobody except for the rightful Persian king was allowed to sit on the king's throne. Alexander did something with the throne, didn't he? Yeah, he went. He, he was just going to go and he was going to sit at sit in it. He was going to let every like let all of the Persian nobles who were in the palace just like make sure that they knew that, yeah, he could sit in the seat without being killed. So he went, he sat on the throne in order to demonstrate he was now the rightful king of Persia, but he had a problem. He couldn't fit on it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, dang. So I'm going to guess he was too big. No. What? He was too small. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if I've mentioned this so far, but Alexander was like 5'4". No, holy crap. Yeah, he was a short little guy. I was thinking like 5'8 to 5'10". Oh, no, 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 no. No, he was he was a short... There are several stories that I kind of left out for time about him, about people meeting him and his buddy Hephaestion. Uh, they Because they went everywhere together. So whenever Alexander would like meet somebody important, uh, Hephaestion would be right there and everybody would immediately go and start like trying to give gifts to Hephaestion thinking he was Alexander because Hephaestion was like <laughs> 5'10 or 5'11 and then so Hephaestion... I bet he got pissed at Hephaestion a lot no he always thought it was funny oh wow at least he has a good sense of humor for being a genocidal maniac um he, he had a sense of humor for this one particular thing he was he definitely wasn't self-conscious about his height but yeah so he went he sat on the throne and keep in mind, uh, not only was he f- about 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five maybe, um, Darius was about 6'1". Oh, dang. So he was a tall old guy, and this throne was built specifically for Darius. And so Alexander went and sat on the throne, but he was so short that his feet dangled. <laughs> and so, And so one of his subordinates realized how embarrassing that looked. And so he went and he took the footstool that was underneath the throne. He took it away and replaced it with a table. So he, he brought a table over and put it under Alexander's feet for him to rest his feet on. Okay, so you you mentioned how the throne was made specifically for Darius. That made me curious. Were thrones normally made for each individual king? Or, like most would assume, the throne just passes down for the most part from generation to generation? Um. In Darius's, in like the case of the Persian emperor, every throne was just rebuilt to whatever uh, the height of the new king was um, because they had the money to do it. And it looked better if, uh, because these thrones were usually huge and very ornate and everything. And so you'd have to get a throne that was properly sized with a properly uh, heighted footstool so that when they were sitting on it, they, they were able to sit up and look very regal and their feet would still be able to rest. And so it was just re, rebuilt and resized every time there was a new Persian king. While he was in Susa, uh, Alexander received word from Greece that Sparta had started a full-blown campaign against Macedon in Greece. Oh, damn. Yeah, so uh, shit's starting to go down and like legitimately starting to go down in Greece. And at the same time, the Spartans were being joined by one of Alexander's own governors, the gov- the Macedonian governor in Thrace, who confusingly was a guy named Memnon. <laughs> Memnon raises his head again, even though it's not the same Memnon. <laughs> <laughs> Memnon, you son of a bitch, you're back. Back from the dead. <laughs> um, no, this the no relation to the other Memnon. Uh, this guy was actually not nearly as competent. As- so this is dumb Memnon. This is dumb Memnon, yeah. Memnon's dumb, evil twin brother. So like with all problems in Greece, there wasn't much that Alexander could do about it. But he went ahead and sent some money and he hoped for the best. Uh, it turned like, I think he sent like uh, 3,000 talents, which a talent was a measurement of precious metals that was used back then. It was roughly like 75 pounds. Weird. Yeah, so like 3,000 talents of silver or not silver, of gold, um, sent it back and was like, like, here, use this, buy an army of mercenaries and make sure you get that dealt with. I mean, yeah. It turns out that he didn't actually have anything to worry about because uh, by the time that word had reached them of this campaign against Sparta, Memnon had already surrendered and the Spartan army had already been killed 
Oh, dang. Like, just completely wiped out to a man at the Battle of Megalopolis. Holy crap. So sick. I bring this up mainly um, to point out, like, how far away Alexander is from Greece at this point. It is, it's literally taking months for him to get word about anything going on in Greece. I mean, he's a damn good distance away. Um, so, like, literally, by the time he find out about found out about this revolt, the revolt had already been put down, and that that war was over. In fact, the Battle of Megalopolis was fought the same week as the Battle of uh, Gagamela had been. That is a really long time. Yeah, yeah. So it's about two months since that happened. Oh, Jesus, that's a long time. Uh, so now Alexander had two choices of where to go next from Susa. Either he could head northeast to the city of Ecbatana, which happened to be where Darius was at that moment, or he could head southeast towards the Persian capital capital of Persepolis, um, which was like the headquarters of the entire Persian Empire. The problem was, to go in either direction, he'd have to pass through the Zagros Mountains. And by this point, it was winter which meant that those mountains would be completely covered with snow and freezing cold. And any reasonable person would have looked at that and decided to wait for spring when all of the passes would be clear of snow. And that was what Darius was counting on. So that he would have some time to raise what little bits of an army he could. But Darius, once again, made the mistake of assuming that Alexander was a reasonable person. I, I, probably wouldn't have made that assumption at this point in his career. People people keep making this mistake over and over again. Alexander was not a reasonable person. If he's if the he's not going to be stopped in by some snow, it's not going to happen. He'll he he can do it and he'll come through with his army pretty much intact. He'll find a way. He always does. I don't know why Darius didn't understand that by this point. I I mean, I feel like they should have picked it up by then. Because, like... They should have. It was very obvious Alexander wasn't going to be spooked away by normal shit. So, the Macedonians set out towards Persepolis in January of 330. The satrap of the region of Persis, which was where Persepolis was was this guy named Ario Barzanis. And he was a little bit, just slightly a little bit smarter than Darius was. And he knew that Alexander was crazy enough to try and attempt this march through the Zagros Mountains in the middle of winter. Of course. Yeah, so he had about an army of about 25,000 at his disposal, which seems like a lot, but they were mostly like local levies, just like farmers that have been plucked out of their homes and given spears and stuff. But he figured that he could hold Alexander's army at a mountain gorge called the Susian Gates. Um, There were only two routes from Susa to Persepolis, and he decided that if he could hold the Susian Gates, then either Alexander would attack and be repelled from the Susian Gates with heavy losses, or that he would go around the long route, which would give him time to pull back to the city and fortify it for a siege. I mean, solid idea, but this is Alexander. Yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, for a normal, if you're facing a normal commander in battle, like this is a completely reasonable and a very astute and good way to approach the situation. The problem was he wasn't fighting a normal general, he was fighting Alexander. So Ario Barzani was not counting on Alexander. Alexander bullshit? Alexander bullshit, yes. You remember that thing? Um, I told you about in the first episode when he went to subdue the Thessalian League right after he was crowned. Isn't that where he juked him, basically? Uh, where he carved some stairs out of a mountain. Oh, shit. That one. Okay. Yeah, he's about to do something very similar. <laughs> oh, shit. Um, so, Alexander. Well, it just seems like that any obstacle in his way, he just overcomes. He's like, oh, I need some stairs. Fuck, I'll make it. I need a navy. I'll just acquire one. I'll just get one out of thin air. (laughs) Oh my God, this guy. So he approaches the, he sends his army out and he approaches the Susan gates and he does something really weird. He went, he goes ahead and he tries a forward assault on the Susan gates, which gets hunt, 
How does that work? It does not work well. He gets hundreds of his own troops killed with arrows and booby traps. Like, like the Persian, the Persian army there had giant boulders that they just rolled down the hill and it crushed dozens of soldiers <laughs> and just broke up the phalanx ranks. Jesus. Uh, sit. Yeah, so this initial attack goes horribly for Alexander, which I am i really wasn't able to figure out why he decided to go ahead and try it. He should have known better. He really, he should have. Like, that's actually very un-Alexander, like, just to do a forward charge. It makes me wonder if he's kind of, like, his, his nerves are rattled at this point. Do we have a, a reason for them to be really rattled? I mean, like, from all we you've told me so far... He he has no reason to be rattled. He he's a, a king god. He's doing his shit. He's well, yeah. He well he does he does have two reasons to be rattled. The first thing is that he still doesn't have Darius, and without Darius, he really doesn't have a he doesn't he doesn't really have a lot of options for trying to convince the Persians to recognize his claim to the Persian throne, which is what he really needs for this conquest to succeed. I mean, you're right, you're right. And the second thing is that his troops are very much starting to become disillusioned with him. And he can sense that. He can pick up on that when he's in camp. And that it's it, there's a wall being built up between him and his troops. And he's starting to become a little distrustful. I, I, I can imagine. Yeah, so that's why I think that maybe his nerves are starting to get a little wrecked at this point. He's kind of starting to make bad decisions. I don't know, I might have just missed something, but that's... that. That's what it seems like to me. But during this initial attack, they actually captured one of the Persian soldiers who, like like I said before, this army is just a bunch of like local conscripts. One of the guys that they ca- captured was actually a shepherd who lived in the area and knew a bunch of like local routes through the mountains. Um, and so they offered to show him a route around the mountain that would get him, get his army behind the Persian lines. So for... A few astute listeners who are who are hearing this right now, you'll notice this is the exact same thing that happened uh, to the 300 Spartans at the Battle of Thermopylae during the Second Persian Invasion. Like, like beat for beat, that's the exact same thing that happened. It's come being, it's now been completely turned against the Persians now. So, Alexander left about half his army uh, to defend the front and to trick the Persians into thinking he was still there while he took the other half along this trail. Um, It was only about 12 miles, but it took them a full day and two nights of continuous marching without sleep to get to the other end, because it was just such bad terrain. Um, But when they arrived, they were able to form up, and they sounded the trumpets so that both sides could attack at once. And so they closed in and completely encircled this Persian army. Oh, damn. That sounds like some next level military tactics. Is that kind of, was that a normal thing or was that like a off the wall technique back then? I mean, if any, any, uh, any commander, if they had the opportunity to do that, could pull it off pretty easily. Alexander kind of, uh, the, the big, the big problem that a lot of commanders would have had at that time would have been having an army that was disciplined enough to be able to, um, attack at the same time. So if you, a lot of times with a less disciplined army, if you're in a situation like that, you could sound the trumpet, but then only, uh, only one side would end up attacking. And that could mean that the army would, that the enemy army would be able to get out from the other side. So it's, it's a, it's a testament both to the ability for Alexander's army to make the kind of trek that they did to get through that mountain in like a day and a half. And also a testament to the kind of organization and discipline that his army had, that they were able to be completely divided and unable to communicate with each other and still attack at the same time. I mean, yeah, it is some next level logistics. Yeah, that's that, that, that was what Alexander really excelled at most of the time. That was pride, like 50% of why his conquests always succeeded. So did he basically find around a way around the the infinite loop problem i know it's a math thing basically you can sit you can plan up like say two armies need to 
are up on a hill and they have a third kingdom that they want to fight and they're trying to work together, but they never know when the other person's seen their message. Is it kind of, did he find a way? Is it that basically what he figured out how to ignore? I, yeah, I guess if I'm understanding you correctly, basically it's like he, he's, he's able to plan out every detail of his operation well in advance and be able to tell his sub commanders every little detail of what they should be doing and when and they okay so he was able to plan way deep into detail and all that stuff right so um they would know exactly what to do when to do it and they'd have the discipline to be able to carry it out effectively i mean that's impressive even for back then yeah so it's um if if you've got a really well trained and well disciplined army, a lot of times they can just like, especially in like in the thick of battle, they can kind of they can kind of make maneuvers and compensate for the shortcomings of like another part of the army just by knowing what, kind of instinctively knowing what that their other like commanders are going to be doing. When you have an army that's that disciplined, they can kind of be in tune like that, and so they can. Um, th- I don't, does that make sense? Like, I don't know if I'm explaining myself. Yeah. Kind of put into a better light, like the actual intricacies of the type of warfare that we're talking about here. Cause that is like a legitimate problem in like real life. Ancient warfare was uh, how, how can you possibly be sure that your message has gone through? You're kind of running a lot of these operations on faith that uh, these systems have all worked as they're supposed to. And uh, it just so happened that Alexander, his army being per- the closest, like uh, just a well-oiled machine, 99% of the time, it's going to function exactly as intended. And so that's how that's how they made their decisions is on the assumption that it would end up working. And very, very rarely did that end up not being the case. Um, so now the road was now with, you know, 25,000 people now dead. The road was now clear to Persepolis and they could get through. Alexander had to hurry because he received a letter from the garrison commander, the garrison commander in Persepolis basically saying, uh, well, we're willing to surrender the city to you, but you have to get here quickly because our garrison is, I'm, I don't have control over the garrison anymore and they're going to flee. And if they flee, they're taking the treasury with them. So you got to get here quick if you want the treasury. And so he set off with his companion cavalry. He left all of his infantry behind and they set off in, ahead of them so that they could reach the city as quickly as possible. They reached the river Araxes like a day later. And they realized once they reached those rivers, they didn't have a bridge that they could cross. Does he pull more Alexander bullshit and just build a bridge? Essentially. Yeah. He just, <laughs> he, he, he goes over to this village that's right there on the river, and he just tears down all of the buildings. Oh, goodness. <laughs> he just tears down all these poor people's buildings, and he uses the stone and timber to build a bridge over the river and gets all of his cavalry across. <laughs> so more Alexander BS. That's fucking crazy. So after they crossed the river, they quickly ran into another village. And this is... I I. Honestly, legitimately, this is the most interesting anecdote from entire Alexander's entire life story. Fascinating that this happened. Oh, really? Do tell. So when Alexander and his men approached the village, they were greeted by a bunch of elderly men who were all very obviously not Persian. They came up to Alexander and started talking to him and greeting him in Greek. They, they all spoke Greek. What? And what was weirder was that every single one of them was mutilated in some way. What in the world? Yeah. All of these men were marked with brands on their foreheads and they were, each of them was missing at least one limb. Were these like slaves or like former prisoners of war? Uh, yeah, that's exactly what they were. They were, uh, they were former Greek mercenaries who had fight fought on the losing side of a civil war in Persia a few decades before then. Oh, interesting. And so when their side lost the war, all of these Greek mercenaries were gathered up and captured and they were resettled in this random village in the middle of nowhere in Persia. While they were there, they were all forced to learn a trade 
So like some of them became farmers, blacksmiths, uh, shepherds. Uh, so are they just using the them as slave labor at this point? Is that why they didn't kill them or? Um, kind of. It wasn't even really slave labor. It was just kind of like they wanted to punish them in, in like the most sadistic way they possibly could. And so they taught all of these guides a trade. And then once they had mastered their trade, any limb that they didn't need to practice that trade was cut off. Oh, fuck. I didn't realize that was what you mean by sadistic. I was like, that doesn't really sound sadistic. Teaching them to trade and making them work. I mean, yeah, it's not fun, but you could live a life like that. But taking away non-essential limbs for it? Jesus Christ. Yeah, and then all of them were also missing like ears and noses. Like Those had been cut off as well. Uh, yeah, and then they had just been dumped in this village and told, okay, live out the rest of your life here. And that's what they had been doing for like, it's probably like 30 or 40 years at this point. I, I might have like the ancient equivalent of bit of bullet at that point. I, I just wouldn't want to live. I'm sure that probably happened. They didn't, the sources don't recount like any stories of like their life there, only that they ended up there. But so Alexander, he offered to send these, all of these men back home to Greece uh, to repatriate them. But uh, they basically told him like, nah, we're, we'd rather stay here. And that was because back in Greece, if they actually went back to like the places where they were born and grew up, they'd be treated as like freaks and like outcasts. I mean, it, it makes sense. It, they were they were afraid of what their former colleagues or their former family members would think of them now that they were mutilated, now that they've been spending years and years in a foreign country doing work for the enemy. Right. They'd, they'd spent decades in this village. And at this point, they didn't even know if like any of their family or friends back home were even still alive. They had no way of knowing. And um, even if they did go back, they would be treated like I mean, the ancient people were not very nice to mutilated people, like people with disabilities. They were, they were very cruel to them. Well, I can imagine, like, we we barely are accepting enough today. In our group, we aren't accepting enough of people who are mutilated today with disabilities and such. I can't imagine how bad it was back then. Yeah, it was, it would have been really bad for them. And by this point, like, all these guys were like best friends. Like they were all neighbors. They had bonded over their shared experience and they had worked together and built an entire community here. It's, it's kind of heartwarming when you think about it. Like, like they had a life here and they didn't really want to give that up. It was all that they had known for decades. So, so instead of sending them back to Greece, uh, Alexander just gave them a bunch of money, just a shit ton of money. And then told them that they were, they were exempt from taxes forever. Like they'd never pay a dime in taxes again for the rest of their lives. And then he said that once he set up his new government in Persia, uh, that government would be responsible for taking care of all of that village's needs until every single one of them had passed away, which is exactly what they ended up doing for the rest of those men's life. They were completely taken care of and lived basically in luxury on Alexander's dime until they all passed. That's awesome, to be honest. Yeah, that's right as hell. Um, I mean, Alexander was not a good person, but at least he took care of his people. Oh, uh, yeah, no, he's going to immediately make this a problem, like, very soon. <laughs> oh, goodness. He's going to use the plight of these men as an excuse for another just enormous atrocity. How many atrocities is he going to make in this episode? Um, Let's see, at least two. Jeez. So, yeah. Um, well, three, um, but the third one is kind of different in form. Not in... Se- kind of different in severity, but also different in form. It kind of depends on how you see it. But um, So, he left this village behind, and he and his cavalry arrived at the city of Persepolis. Which, by the way, I'd like to point out that Persepolis was not the Persian name for it. It was the Greek name. I cannot remember off the top of my head what the Persian name was, but Persepolis is literally Greek for Persian city. Just very uncreative. It's very, very uncreative. It's literally just 
Perse is Persian, and Polis is just city. <laughs> That's pretty insulting. I, I realized that as I was reading it while I was writing the script, and I realized, wait a minute, that just means Persian city. That's how much they carried for that city. Ah, fuck you, it's just a Persian city. Um, so they reach Persepolis on January 31st, 330... Yeah, 330... I, I wrote 331, I'm pretty sure I meant 330. But the city wasn't just the capital of the Achaemenid Empire. It was also the center of the Persian religion, which was Zoroastrianism. Okay. Like, the biography I read actually compared Persepolis to Jerusalem or to Mecca in how important it was to the spirituality of these people. It was a, it was a site of all of the important Zoroastrian ceremonies. It was the traditional burial place of all of the Achaemenid kings. And it was the place where the Persian kings were crowned on their ascension to the throne. And when Alexander and his army arrived, he ordered the city to be sacked. Well, of course. Yeah. Um, and it, it kind of seems like, like, I suppose, like, if you've, if you've already learned about what he did to Tyre and to Gaza and to Thebes, like, it, it, it tracks, like, this is within like the realm of possibility for what he would do. But this kind of seems like it came out of nowhere because again, he was trying to be the Persian King and he was trying to ingratiate himself to the Persian people. So it makes you wonder what was, what was his state of mind at the moment that he ordered this city, which he needed to be on his side in order to justify his claim to the throne, why he would choose to sack it and to order every adult man to be killed. I honestly could not guess because I would have figured that he would have just rounded up the city, held them hostage and be like, well, you're crowning me King and you're going to do it. What would have been even better was if, because they had, they didn't even try to resist. They, they had opened up the gates for him. Um, so he could have just come in. He could have accept, accepted their surrender. He could have gone to the priests of, the temples of Zoroaster and made a deal or tried to strike a deal, or at least at the very least start to ingratiate himself until he could capture Darius. And by that point he would have all of his ducks in a row and he could be, he could, he'd have the leverage to get himself crowned King. But you have to keep in mind where Alexander's head was at at this time. So despite winning every battle he had come across, he still hadn't captured Darius his attempts to get Darius's family, who, by the way, were still with him up to this point, his attempts to get Darius's family to adopt him had failed. He was becoming less and less trustful of his own troops, and they had been becoming less and less enthusiastic about the campaign, the further east they got, and trusted him less and less. By this point, he realized that his propaganda to the Persian nobility, trying to pass himself off as the rightful successor to Darius, was never going to work. Well, no shit. Yeah, he felt that despite all of his conquests, he was still being denied the crown of Asia that he thought he deserved. He was frustrated, he was exhausted, and against the backdrop of like his own sense of divinity, it makes sense that that would translate into like an Old Testament levels of vengeful wrath. He had a hissy fit. He had a hissy fit, and he had an army, and that's the natural result. That is exactly right. Well, no shit. Like, he, well, I'm going to get my way. You're going to do what I want or else I'm going to fucking go on a blood path. Yeah. Remember, at this point, he's still like 28. He's he's still... Jesus. It, it still baffles me he was as young as he was when he was doing all this shit. I know that we've talked about how young he is, but it still, it still boggles my mind that he does all this stuff before some of our, some of our parents were there at their ages now. Like... A lot of like people in the U.S. don't hold a lot of political power until they're in what their thirties or forties. Yeah, we have like we. I've heard our political system referred to as as a gerontocracy. It's you're not wrong. You're not wrong. I I don't know exactly what that means, but it just sounds correct. <laughs> uh, it means uh, rule of the elderly. Yes, exactly. I mean, d look at our past two. Uh, presidential candidates. Anyways, we were talking about the sacking of an ancient holy city. All of this stuff was um, 
like weighing on Alexander's mind. And he also figured that like in the moment, he kind of figured if he couldn't convince the Persians to accept him as the king of kings, then he would force them to at the point of a sword. As one does when son of Zeus. Yeah, this is this is one of Alexander's rare, like poor miscal like bad miscalculations. Um so Alexander told his men that the palaces and the citadel where the treasury was held were off limits. But besides that, they could loot whatever they wanted. And like I said, he also told them to kill every man that they came across. So for an entire day, the Macedonian troops be- were breaking into homes, killing randomly, carrying off whatever gold and silver and gems that they could find. A lot. Some of the sources recount that like a lot of the residents started killing themselves instead of facing the Macedonians. Jesus, you know you you're evil when your people, the people, would rather commit suicide than deal with you. Yeah, you you know you're on the like the you're the bad guys of this situation if this is happening. A lot of the Macedonians ended up. It, this is really weird. A lot of them would get a, end up getting into like drunken fights over loot and killing each other. Of course. Uh, like if like if a Macedonian like yeah because of course like ancient warfare they were all like drinking while they were doing all of this and so like they they were all drunk randomly killing people they would see another Macedonian soldier with just a handful of loot and they'd go and kill him to get his loot so uh, that is a uh, booze murder so let's go ahead and take a shot oh I hate you Derek <laughs> you didn't give me any warning on that one. Down the hatch. Ooh. Smoothest rum I've ever had. Now, if you thought that that was evil... Wait till you see what Alexander does next. Well, just while all of this is going on, he's doing some real supervillain shit. Oh, really? So imagine, like, the backdrop of, like, this entire city becoming an orgy of violence and murder. And while all this is happening, on his orders, he's wandering through the royal treasury... Uh, counting up all of the money that he's now captured for himself. Well, of course, you got to count your riches before your eggs hatch. Yeah. Uh, up to this point, I haven't. I've I've kind of hinted at a few figures that about like how much wealth Alexander was getting. I figured I'd try and give like some general figures. So in the ancient sources, like I said, they measured bulk commodities, especially gold and silver, in a measurement called talents, which is about seventy-five pounds. Yeah, you mentioned that. At Issus, Alexander had looted about 30,000 talents of gold from Darius's baggage train. Jesus. In Susa, he had received about 40,000. Oh, good God. Um, when I mentioned earlier the Spartan revolt, when the Spartans rose up and tried to fight back against the Macedonians, he had sent Antipater, his regent, 3,000 talents on the understanding that that would be enough to pay an entire mercenary army for a long campaign. So that gives you an idea of like how much money, how much this is worth. Yeah, that that's that almost sounds like dragon sitting on a horde levels of wealth. It honestly was. And you know what? In these vaults in Persepolis, he looted 120,000 talents of gold. Oh jeez. 120,000 he found 8,000 talents worth of gold just in Darius's bedroom. What the fuck? How do you have that much money in your bedroom? It's a big trip. It's a big bedroom. <laughs> Everything was made of gold. Still, I would never keep that. Like, I would never keep more than like, unless it's like a safe part of my bedroom, which I wouldn't count part of my bedroom. I wouldn't keep nearly that much in my bedroom. Yeah, keep in mind that this is a palace that's regularly just filled to the like a small army worth of bodyguards at any given time and surrounded by an entire populace who's convinced that you're literally a living god. Jesus. Yeah. So it it that that's a big reason why you had to have like solid gold everything in these palaces was like, well, people think you're a god, you have to play the part. No shit. Yes, yeah, so solid gold dresser uh solid gold bed frame solid gold toilet solid gold chest to keep all of my gold in it's just all gold <laughs> another way to put this amount of money into perspective think about like the, this is actually an example that the biography i read gave 
So think about the Athenian Empire, like the the city of Athens in its heyday before the Peloponnesian War, when it was the superpower in Greece. This massive, sprawling naval empire it had all over the Aegean Sea. The amount of gold that Alexander found in that building was equivalent to the entire budget of the Athenian Empire at its height for three. Holy crap. But, no, no, no. I'm not done. The height, the entire budget of the Athenian Empire at its height for 300 years. Who the has a was it? Uh, it's okay. So the entire budget of the city of Athens, when they were at their most powerful and most rich, that entire budget for a single year times 300. That sounds like an great over exaggeration. It's it's not. It's legitimately not. That's well, I, I get you wouldn't be putting those numbers out if it wasn't real. But that feels like the amount of money that some like you know this the upper middle class guy in class was always boasting about what his parents could buy. Well, my parents could buy three hundred of those. But that that just puts into perspective, like does that gold came from the tax revenue of an empire that essentially spanned an entire small continent, a continent which ex- it included some of the richest areas on the planet. Yeah, Alexander was legitimate. He was at this moment. He was probably the richest single human being on the planet. Do you think anyone's ever come close to being as rich as Alexander was? Oh yeah, there's been plenty of people who've been way past this. Uh, Mansa Musa, who was a king of the Mali Empire in West Africa, his entire economy was literally gold mines. Like Mali is the richest, the most gold rich geography on the planet and so they literally just they they mined gold like at the same rate that a lot of countries like farm and so um it's it's been speculated that he was probably the richest guy who ever lived it's kind of up for debate but um there are de- there's definitely been people who have been richer than alexander but at this moment it's it's probably him well, I sure to God to hope so with the way he's flaunting his money like that. Uh, just taking over entire continents or trying to. And so now Alexander's basically done at this point. He set out what, what he wanted to do. Like the empire that Cyrus founded is now his. He controlled all of the land from the Aegean Sea to the Zagros Mountains. He had accomplished something that surpassed even the most amazing legends of the demigods that he looked up to if he if he were a reason if big if he were a reasonable person what he would do next is just you know finish tying up loose ends he'd march on the city of ecbatana capture darius and secure the throne of persia and then just dtfo right yeah and then he'd be done but he was not a reasonable person as we keep saying there's no way to look at Alexander and say, yeah, that's a normal man of this times. Yeah, this is, this is, he was not a normal guy by any time period standards. Like, uh, I've mentioned this before, but like, if he had been born at any other time and time and place, he'd just be like the the annoying self-centered asshole at the party uh, that nobody wanted to hang out with. But because he was born into a situation where he was both rich and had an enormous well-trained army. He conquered most of the known world. It, it's, it's funny how people, where how history ends up shaking out. But because he was not a reasonable person, he did not march on Ecbatana. Instead, he stayed put. What? Why? What kind of benefit would that give him? There was a, a kind of good reason. So he stayed in Persepolis for about five months. He wasn't really doing much besides like hunting and like visiting local tourist spots. Like he went and visited the tomb of Cyrus the Great in the city of Pasargade. One theory as to why he waited was because his communications with Greece, or they, it was believed that his communications with Greece had broken down and that he was waiting to hear back about the war with Sparta before he continued. Because again, like he didn't know that the war had already been won. And so the theory goes that he was concerned about that and wanted to hunker down and make sure everything was okay before he continued. I can understand that, but it's still like, dude, Go back and reinforce your home troops and get shit done. That might have been a concern for a normal commander. This was probably wrong for two reasons. One, 
he was a master of organizing line of commun- lines of communication. If his communications were ever cut off at all, they wouldn't have been for long, especially not for five months. No, there's no way. The way I've heard you talk about him, I do not believe he would willingly let that sit still and be idle on that. He would be actively working to fix that. The second thing, he didn't care about Greece anymore. No, no. You that is very plainly clear with the way he's progressed through Persia and the rest of it, Asia. Yeah, the place where he was born, he could not care less about anymore. It did not matter to him in the slightest. He had the entire Persian Empire at his fingertips now. He had no like at this point Greece was a uh provincial region to his empire. It was it was on the on the peripheries it didn't matter anymore to him i can't imagine him really caring about greece at that point to be honest he he he's conquered so much land why be settled with just greece continue conquering conquer the globe yeah can yeah can you imagine if like you had had spent your entire life conquering the entire planet how important would your own home state be to you at that point i wouldn't give flying two shits so in reality, what most like what the most likely reason why he stayed was because he wanted to be there for the Persian New Year's festival, which is also called Nauruz. Um, Nauruz is really interesting because it's actually still celebrated to this day. I've never heard of it. Yeah, it's uh, the Persian New Year, or the Zoroastrian New Year, I suppose. It's celebrated mainly in Persia, but it's also a lot of Kurdish com- communities celebrated as well. A lot of different areas around like east, the eastern part of the Middle East. But in ancient Persia, it also acted as an annual recrowning ceremony for the king of Persia. So the ceremony where uh, the king of Persia would symbolically fight a demon and defeat it in battle, and the priests of the Zoroastrian god Ahura Mazda would ceremonially recrown him every year. That sounds like some next level LSD shit. It it's actually really cool. Like if you uh, read about like how the ceremony worked, it's like a week of fe- like a week of partying in the streets and and just everybody getting drunk all the time. Sip. I mean, I wouldn't say no. Yeah, it's it sounds like a lot of fun. It's something. It's one of those places. Like if I had a time machine, it's one of those things I would have wanted to go back and see. Oh, well, there's so much stuff that me and you would get into if we had access to a time machine, Derek. We would do so much to just so much damage to the timeline. Okay, if you had the opportunity to go back and see one thing from history, what would it be? How far back in history? Because we can argue left and right, theoretical events, uh, modern history, ancient history, what? Anything. Literally anything. I would hope to find... I would like to see... The people that a lot, it it wouldn't matter what mythology, but some real life figures had to have spawned a lot of mythological figures, right? I would like to view the events that inspired a whole pantheon. If we could figure out where to travel to there. That's what I want to see is the actual origin of a pantheon, whether it be Norse, Greek, Egyptian, Christianity. I would just love to see the actual historical events that caused a whole religion to be birthed, whether or not it's like actually significant, because that kind of settles like how bad does this telephone game of our history work, you know? Yeah, like uh, like Gilgamesh. Yes. Uh, isn't there a lot of inspiration of the Gilgamesh uh, tale in the Bible, too? Uh, I don't know. It, it's the isn't it very similar to our flood myth yeah there is like a very similar flood myth in the story of gilgamesh like in the in the epic uh gilgamesh goes and visits a guy uh who sur- who survived a flood by building a boat and as compensation for forcing him to witness the destruction of the human race uh the gods made him uh immortal so he could live forever that that was in the epic of gilgamesh i've never actually heard it but i've heard like okay, this is basically the breakdown, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, Alexander wanted to stick around Persepolis so that he could be 
there for the celebration of Daruz, which is where traditionally the Persian kings went through this recrowning ceremony. The idea was if he was there for Nauruz, he could convince the priests of Ahura Mazda to crown him instead of Darius. But then the months went on and on, and they finally reached April when the celebration is supposed to be, April 20th specifically. Or it's supposed to be about April 15th, but by April 20th, he kind of realized, oh, they're just not going to put on the celebration. Without Darius present, they are not going to have this festival. Well, no shit. You came in and conquered. They're not just going to throw a festival and say, oh, you're the biggest power in the area. Of course you can be the king in our ceremony. Yeah. You just you just killed like the vast majority of the male population of the city and a good chunk probably of the women, too. And then you expect these people to just give you the crown. It's you shit twice and fell in. <laughs> He's just a pretentious rich kid. Obviously, like he doesn't it feels like he doesn't know the meaning of no at this point. He's he's gone on and won so much and like been so successful. He doesn't understand. People aren't always going to go along with what he wants. He's just a rich brat who never learned how to take no for an answer. And and because he has an army now everybody is paying the price for it. And it, I Oh, one of my favorite quotes. History doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Uh, I very much disagree. History is very much on cycles. It may be a reprise, and it's not exactly the same, but it does repeat itself, in my opinion. Another good quote about that. uh, It comes from Karl Marx. He said that Hegel remarked somewhere that every great personage appears in history in, in a sense twice. He forgot to mention first as tragedy, second as farce. Could you go on what you mean by that? Because I, 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 I kind of get the message, but I, I, I feel like I'm missing something there. Yeah. So, so history often has in the that quote he was specifically referring to the rise of Louis Napoleon to become the emperor of France, uh, who was the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte. And so, in this book that he wrote, uh, it's called the 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon. Um, he was talking about how all of these different, all all of these events kind of mirrored how it happened that uh, Louis or that Napoleon Bonaparte was able to come to power in the coup of 18th Brumaire, and it kind of ha- ha- kind of happened in a lot of the same ways with his nephew, but with the key except the key difference being that Louis Napoleon or Napoleon the Third was a complete moron. Oh, okay. Um, and so it was just kind of showing like history will often show like will often repeat the same conditions and cause similar things to happen multiple times, but it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that the that they're exact like one to one uh like cycles so basically it's not like you're filling in a pattern you're just getting like high mark a high mark c and high mark e and then B, D, and F could be different. I'm going to level with you, man. I'm not a math guy. I'm a history guy. (laughs) Well, that's not even a math thing. It's just basically like this half of it came true, but that part didn't again. This part after that part did as well, but the next part didn't, but after that did and blah, blah, blah. Like it comes in fraction. Yeah, I get, I kind of get what you're saying. Um, uh, Okay, I lied. I don't really... (laughs) We'll just call the. We'll just lie and say you did. Okay. Yeah. Um. So, anyways. Um. So finally, April twentieth rolls around. It's five days after the festival should have started, and he gives up hope. And so he he just. Well, I would hope so. I feel like five days is pretty quick for Alexander, though. I would have assumed he would have waited a whole month and just been like, ah, maybe the star alignment's a little bit different this year or blah, blah, blah. Um, no, he, he was usually pretty, he thought, usually thought pretty quickly on his feet. It, he was just waiting to see like how they would respond to having the time of the festival come around uh, with everything that had happened. But by, by April 20th, 420, uh, blaze up, he, he finally gave up hope. And he decided to step out of the city for a little while and clear his mind and think about what his next move is going to be. 
And so he decided to take a vacation doing his favorite activity, which is taking his army out and pacifying the countryside. Pacifying, yeah. We'll call it that. Um, so he took his army out. He started trying to force the capitulation of some of the tribes that lived in the Zagros Mountains. He, is, he and his army spent a month out there with almost no results. Like, the, uh, it was the summer rains were starting to come up, and it was causing the mountainous terrain to become really slick and muddy, which slowed down his troops and disrupted their uh, formations. And so whenever they got into a fight with some of the tribespeople, these tribespeople had women slingers. So these women who would use slings, which is basically just a strip of leather with a rock in it, which they would swing around and then just shoot, just let go and shoot the rock at them. And these rocks could get up to like 120 miles an hour. Oh, well, that, that'd be painful if not deadly. Uh, it could pierce armor. It it literally pierced armor. That's, it was one of the most common and easy ways to have like a skirmishing unit in your army. I think I think Alexander actually had some some slingers at some point in his army as well. I wouldn't be surprised if he did or um but yeah the the Macedonians went up to the Tsar into the mountains and just got their shit kicked in by a bunch of tribesmen also sit because a lot of Macedonians died. I, I, so you're saying they got their shit rocked by a bunch of primitives to them? Obviously they weren't, but they would have looked down on them obviously. Yeah, they not only were they Eastern barbarians, but they were also like country folk. So like double barbarian up and they managed to push Alexander's army out. And so obviously this did not turn out to be like the relaxing sojourn that Alexander was looking for to try and blow off some steam. Well, no, duh. He's used to just pile driving over people and to get his shit rocked by people he would consider inferior. That's just the ultimate irony. So he ended up coming back even more frustrated than when he left. They figuratively boo balled him. They, they, they did. They blue balled him. So he had been kicking around this idea for a few months. He didn't go through with it because he decided to wait until the Persian New Year. Um, to see what they did with the festival. But this past month of being up in the mountains had finally convinced him to go through with it. And so when he returned, he ordered his army to burn the city to the ground. So, fuck you, I don't get what I want, you all die? Yeah. So, of course. It was a literal hissy fit, wasn't it? It literally was. This was the worst hissy fit in human history. This was a hissy fit with a body count in the thousands. Oh, Jesus Christ. I didn't think it was that big of a body count. Holy crap. Thousands. So, of course, his generals told him this was an awful idea. An, op an opinion that is actually shared by pretty much every historian. I couldn't imagine being that a smart move. There's no way he gets out of that with anyone. Like, I can't imagine his men being okay with this situation, let alone the people who he's doing it to well they they didn't care because it was just a bunch of persian barbarians they couldn't care less about him um and they they were always happy to do some looting and burning but even like so one one historian who is kind of notorious for being the biggest apologist for alexander besides alexander's own propagandists was a roman named arian and he wrote like this uh, several volumes that ended up being like a long his biographical history of his life and still one of the best sources we have. But he was very apologetic for a lot of the stuff that Alexander did. Even he was like, no, nah, this was a really bad move. This was a really bad thing that Alexander did. So even his kiss asses were like, nah, there's no defending in this shit. Yeah, even his kiss asses were like, oh, this is this is a really bad idea. <laughs> Um, but Alexander decided that there was no other way to bring Persia in line. Uh, they weren't going to accept him as their king voluntarily. Uh, so he was just going to use terrorism to force them to recognize him. As one does. Um, there is one story to how this happened that tries to take the blame off of Alexander by claiming that he was drunk and that he was goaded into burning Darius's palaces by, you remember that guy, one of his generals, Ptolemy? Yeah. Um, so the story goes that Ptolemy's mistress, during like a night of drunken debauchery, Ptolemy's mistress convinced Alexander to burn 
Darius's palace. And then from there, the fire spread and burned the rest of the city down. This is obviously a modern context, but I don't even think that's a good way to defend it. Oh, this drunk mistress convinced him to do it, hyped him up, blah, blah, blah. Also, a lot of people died in this fire, and the story goes that he was drunk, so shot. <laughs> Again? You don't give me a warning for a shot? <laughs> I hate you sometimes, Derek. I hate you sometimes. Bottoms up. Yeah, so that story is very much on the face of it, just a bold faced lie. For one thing, uh, it reeks of the kind of sexism that a lot of historians have used to pass off blame from like historic male figures. Uh, so like throughout history, you'll have historians who are like, well, this this figure was a very noble and virtuous man, but he did this bad thing. So we're just going to write out that right in there that a woman made him do it so that we can pass the blame off from him and blame it on those uh, perfidious females. Our our great hero could never have done that without outside influence. It had to have been the evil women. Yeah, but another thing is that it's almost certain that just like with Thebes and Tyre and Gaza, he was just infuriated that the city wasn't recognizing his authority, and so he responded with more rage than logic. Again, he had a hissy fit. Yes, he had a hissy fit. This we should just title this episode Alexander's. Decades long, not literally, but Alexander's years long hissy fit. Yeah. So a small, after the fire, a small portion of the city would be rebuilt and act as the capital of Macedonian controlled Persia for a little while. Uh, But by the time of the Muslim expansions, which were about the seventh century, the city was completely abandoned. We're not really sure about like what the population looked like between those two periods, but it was never very big, and it was definitely completely abandoned by the time that the that Persia became Muslim. Well, I can imagine you just basically raised the entire goddamn city to the ground. Um, today, all that's left of the city are the foundations and a few columns. I'm honestly impressed. Anything lasted today? Yeah, there's a lot of like, uh, like in some like basement levels from some of the foundations that you can still find like mosaics and. Uh, wall paintings that were preserved by the fires like they were heat blasted and that preserved them for millennia okay i would actually love to see that someday yeah it's a um the few like the little bit of uh googling around i did of this the the archaeology archaeology site is really really interesting alexander would end up coming to regret this obviously I can imagine how this works out for him and he nots regrets it. This is a major historical site that he burns to the ground because he's not getting his way when that's a major center point of crowning the new king of the area he wants to rule over. Right. And that's exactly what that's exactly it. Um, if he had kept the city intact, there's a chance, however slim, that once he finally caught up to Darius, he could finally convince the city to recognize his claim to the throne. But now he would have to waste countless lives and unbelievable amounts of resources to forcefully subjugate Persia. He would never be able to get them on his side willingly. Well, I can tell you right fucking now, if someone did the equivalent to me, I don't have a lot of patriotism, but you still don't go that damn far and burn that many historical, that big of a historical site down. Yeah, if some random Greek guy came through and burned New York City to the ground, I'd, you know, have a little bit of a problem with him. Yeah, yeah. I... Um, so Alexander's next move was clear. Um, if he was going to finish this with any semblance of, like, being able to tie up loose ends, um, he'd have to capture Darius and force him to abdicate the throne. I mean, I feel like that's the only way... He gets the throne without just basically terrorizing the people into submission. And I, what you've said before, it doesn't feel like that's what's happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, all he has done so far is harden Persian opinion against him. With like, They have good reason to have their opinion hardened of him. That He's a complete monster from every aspect. He's not a good person. Yeah, he, I'm on the Persian side with this one. I don't blame them. So he and his army set off in June 
towards the city of Ecbatana in a region of Persia called Medea. So do you remember when I was talking about like the revolt of Cyrus and how he ended up conquering the empire that used to rule over him? Vaguely. Uh, yeah, so that's how the Persian Empire was founded. It started out in Persepolis. I think it was Persepolis with Cyrus's revolt. And he was a subject of the Median Empire. Okay. So now now we're in the area that's now northern Iran. Uh, it's referred to as Medea, and it was the site of the former Median Empire, which is it's now by this point is thoroughly Persianized. Of course. Anyways, um, Alexander had heard that Darius had once again raised an army. You know, I, I, <laughs> another army. But you said they didn't interact again. So did the armies just not meet, or was this a bold-faced lie? Um, you'll see. Uh, he did. He did kind of have an army, in the, kind of, sorta. They, but he. Okay, do explain. I'll let you continue with your story. So Darius raised a new army, and Alexander went out to face him. But Darius had learned his lesson by this point, and he had fled from Ecbatana. Um. So when they, when the Macedonians reached the city, Alexander decided it was time to streamline his army. So from this point forward, the campaign of retribution against Persia that he had used to justify this invasion, that was done. That was no longer a thing anymore. I honestly feel like it had been done since the beginning of the episode. You said that he initially went in with Asia Minor only. I feel like a bunch of his men checked out as soon as they were like, we've conquered Asia Minor. We don't need to go for all of Asia. You need to just cool your shit. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and he was he was definitely picking that up from his troops, which is why he made this decision to basically make it official. And so uh, so he let go of all of his uh, non-Macedonian Greek troops. I feel like that's a mistake. Ah, it, it would have been a mistake, but then he does something else. So he gave them all a huge bonus and told them that they were free to leave. But anybody who wanted to stay and continue to fight with him would get even an even bigger bonus. Interesting. Did it work out for him? Yeah. Almost all of them stayed. Um, so now, now he didn't have to keep them around on the promise. They were liberating Greek cities. Now they were, now they were on. Hey, they were raping and pillaging. You want a big bonus? We'll go for it. Yeah. Um, so now they were just explicitly mercenaries. And so in the process, this also made sure that his army was completely loyal to him and him alone, because now they were they weren't fighting for their home cities under Alexander. They were now fighting directly for Alexander and the paycheck he was giving to them. We're not fighting for a holy war. We're fighting for the damn money and the damn money is good. We don't care what we do. We don't care what atrocities we make. Oh, yeah, I legitimately probably the best paid soldiers in human history at this point. Like it, if not at least in the top 10, like best paid soldiers in human history. Um, to that end, he also released uh, Parminio from his command of the Thessalian cavalry. You remember Parminio? Um, he's come up, come up several times. Vaguely was, he was part of um, the Persian uh, hostages, right? No. Uh, no, he, so he, he started out in the story. He was a member of, uh, Philip loyalists who were part of the camp that, um, the old guard of the Macedonian army, uh, who were still loyal to Philip when Philip was killed and who Alexander had to bring into the fold. And so, so could he not have just cut those people initially or was he forced to work with those people? He had to work with those people because they were the ones who had the army. I guess that makes sense. I just feel like as if if I'm in Alexander's shoes, again, this is with someone who understands with a modern education where maybe we know a more basic level of tactics than most people. I would have cut them out immediately as I could because I would not trust them not to betray me. Um, he, Alexander, really didn't have a choice because the the army was loyal to to Parminio and to some of the other old guard generals. So if he had, so he, he, his arms, he, he was in a no win position. He had to keep them no matter what. Yeah. And up to this point, he had struck a balancing act with, uh, Parminio's influence 
um, within the army because he had had uh, several of Parmenio's family members, uh, a couple of his sons, several of his son-in-laws had been like major commanders within Alexander's army up to this point. And that had given Parmenio a lot of influence in the army. As as it would in a lot of armies, if you contribute to some of the best soldiers and be like, hey, it, it obviously the equivalent today wouldn't be a direct descendant, but hey, I am a a uh, sergeant or I am a officer who has trained a bunch of really good soldiers. You should promote me. You should keep me in your trusted circle. Yeah, and um, and so because of the influence that Parmenio had in the army, uh, he was always the biggest threat to Alexander's power, and Alexander was constantly trying to like keep him in line and keep him check, keep his power checked, as he well should. He he very obviously was like Alexander's biggest threat within his own guard. Um, and that's it's really interesting. It puts a lot of Alexander's battles into an interesting perspective because it was always. Parmenio was the commander of the Thessalian cavalry, and the Thessalian cavalry under Parmenio's command played some of the most pivotal roles in several of his battles up to this point. They were the the holding left flank at both the Battle of the Granicus and Gagamela. Uh, but now, because Alexander had been able to consolidate so much of his own personal power over his own army, he was able to let Parmenio go without a lot of pushback. I mean, it makes sense. And so... He made Parmenio the garrison commander at the city of Ecbatana and left him behind. <laughs> oh, oh, fuck you. Le- I'm leaving. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that was and it, that was only possible because all of Alexander's new wealth, he could ensure that he could keep the entire army loyal to him with their enormous paychecks. Like, do we have a rough equivalency in today's money or there's no, no way to gauge it? There's really no way to gauge it. Um both because like the spending power of gold back then was completely different from what it is now. And um, so what, how, where in our, our current socioeconomic class, if they were actually able to spend their buying power, his soldiers, where do you think they would be? Um, this is a personal guess. Like this is not like an actual to be taken as seriousness. Just like, where do you think they would be? In if from my understanding, if you think of Alexander as like a billionaire, like an Elon Musk level billionaire, then all of his soldiers would have been like multi millionaires. Okay, so he th- even his soldiers would have been like kind of the one percent, basically. Oh yeah, once they got back to Greece, they made up like the ruling class of Greece just on their wealth alone. Okay, that that's kind of what I assumed. Like, I just wanted to, like, make sure my assumption is right with the question. Yeah. Imagine a private in the U.S. Army today went and spent, like, did, like, a career in the Army, came back and was, like, an E4, like a sergeant. And when he got back home, he could just buy an entire town of his. Oh, my God. That's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. it. I. They made a lot of money. Yeah. I, I can imagine that, gee, that's like today's pay. You'd have to be well into the high ranks to be that kind of level of wealthy. Um, He paid his soldiers damn good. <laughs> yeah, he paid his soldiers really good because he had the money to do it. And he also didn't really have a choice because he had to keep them going some way because they really didn't want to be doing this at this point. <laughs> and it makes total sense. You've achieved your objective. No one wants to be at war, like actual war, unless there is a real, there's a mission. There is a goal. There's a like. And now the goal is we keep going because Alexander wants to keep conquering. And Alexander's paying them us the big bucks. So Parmenio is now out of pretty much out of the picture for all intents and purposes. He's still around and he still has influence because several of his, a couple of his sons are actually still in the army at this point. Were they just not that loyal to him or does that end up biting Alexander in the butt later? It won't bite Alexander in the butt because he doesn't allow it to bite him in the butt. So they planned something. It's just Alexander was ready for it. Um, They never got the opportunity to plan something. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, that's how that is how ahead of the curve Alexander was, but we'll get to that. 
that would take some next level logistic planning. He had to been like to be able to predict that and make sure your enemies didn't have the time to work against you, like in your own forces, you had to been pretty ahead of the game, at least under the circumstances. It's not really surprising that Parmenio was con was the kind of political operator who was constantly looking for an edge. You don't live to be as old as Parmenio was. And he was like in his sixties or seventies at this point, you didn't, you didn't live to be that old in the Macedonian army. And in in the Macedonian court, if you weren't, if you didn't know when to cut your losses and you didn't know exactly when to strike. So he was constantly always planning something. Uh, He just never had an opportunity to put something in place to knock Alexander down a few pegs Uh, because Alexander. Where in the timeline is this? Is this, is he still like in his late twenties or has he reached his thirties by this point? Uh, He's still in his late twenties. He's like 27 or 28 at this point. So not a lot of time has passed in this whole timeline we're talking about. So he, Alexander is screwing major power at a much younger age than we're used to seeing, at least in a modern context. He was pretty young for having this kind of power, even by the standards of the time. Something else I wanted to mention is that with Parmenio pretty much out of the picture, Alexander was in a situation where his power was essentially limitless. He uh, Financially, he was no longer limited by the amount of money he had. He literally, for all intents and purposes, had endless amounts of money. And he would only be making more from this point with every city that he conquered. When you have as much power as he does, you could almost go on a fiat money like we do today. He's just like, well, this is what it's worth. You, you can just go with it. Um, and another thing is that, um, are you at all familiar with what happens to dictators psychologically when they gain power within a country? I, I don't know, like from like a historical perspective, but my guess is they're always paranoid. They're always worried about the next person who's trying to usurp their throne. They want to ensure their reign of power. Yes, exactly. Up to this point, Parmenio had acted as his counterbalance to that attitude because Parmenio was in many ways his peer. He was his equal in political power, if not in like, maybe not like actual ceremonial power, in actual real literal power. Parmenio was his equal up to this point. And now Parmenio was out of the picture. He had no equals. So he lost his yin to his yang. He didn't have the person that he was focusing his paranoia at anymore. So it it, it screwed him over in the end, I'm guessing. Right. From this point, he is... When you have that much power, you have no equals. That makes you very isolated. It makes you feel very alone. And when you're alone, you feel paranoid. And that's exactly what happened. What's happening to Alexander. This is an entire process of him becoming more and more and more paranoid. I know I can't speak for Alexander's level of power, but I know that any time, like, I know I'm alone, I can't count on anyone, blah, 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 I become paranoid. I, I worry about every little detail. I want to make sure I'm covering my bases. Yeah, now take that paranoia and add that you own most of the known world, and also you have the most powerful army. I can't imagine the level of paranoia he would have with that. Yeah, and also he believes he's a god. (laughs) So this is... So personally, I view, like, this is because probably I had a lot of evangelical upbringing, Christianity, what if mahoos it, but I view deadic figures as very doubtless so it kind of is a dichotomy to me because alexander obviously is not a god but he viewed himself as god yet he still had self-doubt i don't see them as people who have doubt they just do what they feel is right and they don't give a shit about the consequences yeah that's that that that's it's a very human thing is like when you have that much power um all of your self-doubt becomes like magnified by the same amount of power that you have. And if you have that much self-doubt, you your options are to just give up or to double down on your own self-confidence. And that and of course Alexander being the most self-confident person in human history doubled down hard. I don't think that's a stretch either. 
you, you just call them the most self-confident man in human history. I feel like you could argue that even to this day that he was the most self-confident man in history because he never stopped to think if he was right. He just did. He he didn't he wasn't bogged down about worrying about anything. He just did. Yeah, and cuz again, his upbringing, he was a spoiled brat. He'd had no reason to doubt himself at any point in history or at any point in his life. He had never been told anything except that he was destined for great things and he was perfect just the way he was. And it we shouldn't be raising kids like this. We should. I swear to God, if one of my kids gets this self-confident, I sure, I don't plan on having kids, but <laughs> just knock, just knock him down a few pegs. <laughs> I have screwed up royally as a parent if I ever have a kid who's this self-confident, because that takes some next level failure as a parent to get that self-confident. I mean, yeah, I don't want a kid who's like, like constantly doubting himself and beating himself up. You know, I don't want a kid who's like me. That's a big mood. That's a big mood. Taking Alexander as a case study, a little bit of self-consciousness goes a long way. It very much does. I feel like I could have never gotten to that point because of all my anxieties. And I, I don't think many people are even capable of getting this level. They have to sit in like an echo chamber, like, alexander did to be able to get to this level of self-confidence yeah and he's he's only ever been in an echo chamber he's never the only times he's ever been exposed to dissension from cities which he ended up burning to the ground and killing everybody inside so he hasn't had to face the repercussion of his actions as much like you 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 disagree with me well you fucking die i don't give a shit about your life Oh, you don't think I'm the god and the ruler of all of Asia? Well, I'll just burn your city to the ground. So he left He left Ecbatana, he left Parmenio behind, and he moved out to catch Darius at yet another mountain pass. We've got a lot of mountain passes in the story so far. So is this a near miss, or you said that he never saw Darius again? Uh, we're, we're getting there. He will see Darius one more time, he just won't fight him. Okay. So he... he tried to catch Darius at a mountain pass called the Caspian Gates. After 250 miles of marching through North Iranian desert, he found out that Darius had already passed through the gates and was already heading east, further east of the city of Hecatompolis. That's a, that's a, that's a name. I'm impressed. I got that the first try. Hecatompolis. Hecatompolis. That is a really interesting name. Yeah. It's, it's just another Greek. It, it it's not what was it, what it was actually called in real life. It's what the Greeks called it. I so bit of a tangent. I wonder how many places that everyone calls the technical wrong name just because it's the common speak. The city of Istanbul. Um, it used to be called Constantinople. Do you know why it's called Istanbul now? Because no one could pronounce it Constantinople. No, apparently plenty of people can pronounce Constantinople. I think that's just you. <laughs> I can say it. It's just making like it feels like a hard word to say, you know? No. It feels like supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Uh no, but the reason that it's called Istanbul now is because when the Turks moved in, the nickname that a lot of Greek people had for or the, a lot of Byzantine people had for the for Constantinople, when they were talking about the city, they'd call they'd say, We're going into the city. Or in Greek, it would have been said, it said, Istin Poli, in the city. So it was just a lazy version of saying in the city. So it's, oh my God. Yeah, so, so Istin Poli evolved in, in Turkish into Istanbul. That's one of the dumbest shorthands I've ever heard. Um, anyways, so um, after arriving at the Caspian Gates, uh, he got some more interesting news. Darius had actually been overthrown. Oh, wow. That really takes me by surprise. I couldn't, I didn't think he would get overthrown. And if he did, I would assume it would be Alexander, not someone else. Nope, it was, uh, it was the satrap of Bactria, a guy named Bessus. That's a left field for me. Yeah, it was one of his chief commanders because most, 
uh, ever since the Battle of Issus, most of his army has had been composed of Bactrian troops. Okay. And so Bessus had claimed the throne and declared himself the new Persian king, Artaxerxes IV. That feels very presumptuous. Um, it was just a traditional like Persian king name. You had to take a... No, no, no. Declaring yourself king while the previous king was already in war with someone else that's still fighting over it. I feel like I would have like, okay... I'm working towards this. I'm going to defeat this invader, and then I'll declare myself king. At this point, even though Alexander kept winning, uh, Darius still held the claim and that everybody recognized. Everybody still recognized him as king. And so his, his his throne was still very much his own, even if he didn't even if he didn't own like 90% of his uh of his kingdom anymore. But Bessus now pretty much controlled what was left of the Persian Empire, and he immediately took off into the desert with uh, Darius as his prisoner, and Alexander was right behind him. I bet that goaded Alexander to no end that someone else got Darius before he did. Oh, yeah. Alexander took his cavalry and ran into the desert. They ran for a full night and a full day and reached Darius's camp which by that point had been abandoned, and Darius wasn't there. Bessus and the Persian army had already left with him, and the Macedonians, from there, um, they ended up chasing Bessus. It, uh, this is insane. Um, with because it was an, The only reason I believe that these might be accurate numbers is because it was an all-cavalry force, but they, they ran 50 miles in a single night. That's insane! That's insane, which I 100% believe Alexander would have pushed his men to do this. I believe Alexander would have tried, but I, I, even with Alexander's like next level charisma for his troops, find it hard to believe that he would get his man, men to run 50 goddamn miles in a day. Yeah. Um, regardless of what the actual numbers are, they caught up to Bessus in the morning. They caught the Persians off guard, and in the brief battle that followed, it only lasted a, like like half an hour. Um, all of the Persian arm, army that was there it was only like ten, like less than ten thousand troops. Um, they all either fled or surrendered immediately. A lot of them were killed in the process. So, sip. I need to pull out another beer. And you can't really blame them. Cheers. With, I can only imagine how much overwhelming power that. Alexander brought to that battle, I bet he took the majority of his troops and marched in there, and they weren't even ready for that amount of people. Well, keep in mind, like, none of his infantry were involved in this. It was just his cavalry. So uh, the, it's very likely the Macedonians were actually outnumbered, it, which makes it makes it one of the great ironies of this whole story. So it was a big-ass bluff, is yeah, what you're it was saying. Yeah, it was a huge bluff. Um, if the Persians had kept their heads and had actually formed like a real defense, they probably could have captured or killed Alexander right there. I would like to see tangent, obviously the timeline where that happened. That would be an interesting thought experience to look at. You know, you know, what's funny is the book I read for this re the research on this mentioned the exact same thing. They meant the author mentioned it would be a really inter interesting alternate history. If, to wonder like what would have happened um, if he had actually uh, been captured or killed at this battle. We're getting to the thing that's really going to throw you off. Do I ha need to have another shot ready? Uh, have a sip ready. I have that ready, barely. I'm almost done with my fourth beer, so make it good. Um, so they got done with this attack, the dust was settling, and Alexander had a problem. Darius was dead. Oh, really now? Darius was dead. In the chaos of this attack, Bessus had tried to get him to run from him, or run from Alexander with him, but he had refused. Uh, Bessus didn't want Darius to fall into Alexander's hand, so he had some soldiers stab Darius to death with javelins. That feels very, very petty, but it makes sense historically. It was a practical move if... If Darius had fallen into Alexander's hand, he would have had a bargaining chip for leveraging his own claim to the Persian throne, which Bessus was now trying to hold himself. 
It makes total sense. So, yeah, Darius is dead. Um, according to the story, Darius's body was discovered by a Macedonian soldier. Um, so the story goes that this uh, they were looking for Darius in the aftermath of the battle. And about half a mile north of where the battle took place, uh, this Macedonian soldier had wandered down into wandered down towards a pond so that he could get a drink of water. And off net on the side of the pond was this uh, ox-drawn cart. And so he went over and he was wondering why this cart had been left behind. And so he went off and looked into the cart and found Darius, who was still alive and had just just had like, oh, wow. I assumed they would just leave him like they would confirm his death and just leave the body sitting around for Alexander to find. No, um, this. So after they had stabbed him, they left the javelins in his body and left him in the back of this cart and then run away. And then the ox uh, who was on this cart had gotten thirsty and had walked half a mile up the road to this pond and had started to drink from the pond with Darius still in the cart. And so this Macedonian soldier had wandered across this cart and found Darius, knew it, knew who it was immediately because Darius was still wearing like his royal robes that were like deep, like that dyed purple that was um, like the classic color of uh, like ancient nobility or ancient royalty. Because certain dyes used to be classified with certain levels of nobility because of how hard it was to get certain dyes. Yeah, exactly. And so he he came up to Darius and Darius asked him if he if he could get a drink of water. And so the soldier agreed and took his helmet and got some water and brought it up and gave it to Darius. And purportedly, Darius' last words were, uh, thank you for something along the lines of like, thank you for ensuring that I didn't die alone. And then he just died right there in the soldier's arms. I can't imagine how conflicted you have to be as a soldier to deal with that. Because, yes, this is one of your biggest enemies, but this is still a human fucking being. And you're dealing with someone who actually thanks you because you gave them water before their death. Yeah, it's easy to think that somebody is inferior when you don't see them in a position like that where they're just helpless and bleeding to death and dying in your arms. But so Darius's body was discovered. Al, uh, the soldier went back and got Alexander and they, uh, Alexander went to see his body and Alexander was genuinely like distraught. He was so upset by how Darius had died because by this point, I feel like back then in battle was a death with honor. Uh, as you can imagine, with a lot of time in any part of history, you could probably guess that death in battle was an honor. Dying that way probably felt just as disgusting to Alexander as with Darius, because you that's not the way anyone wants to go out. They either want to die peacefully or they want to die in a glorious battle. And it was it was kind of that he had kind of been it it was kind of like a begrudging respect that he had kind of developed for Darius. He rec- he respected Darius for uh, for being like he considered Darius to be his only equal in the world because Darius was. I didn't think Alexander was capable of recognizing someone as his equal. I thought his ego was too great. Like even if you're talking about the kind of equal that a lot of people say, like. Oh, they might be like, they're close. I figured Alexander, the kind of man that's like, no one even comes close to me. Well, yeah, he, he didn't, he didn't see Darius as equal in like, like divinity. He saw himself as a God and Darius is just a King. Um, but he still, as a King to a King, he still saw Darius as like, well, a king is still deserving of the respect due to his title. And he definitely was not just a king, but the ruler of Asia. Uh, something I really didn't take Alexander as someone to respect equal or equivalent titles. I took Alexander to be the kind of man, you put up or shut up kind of level of respect. You You had to be close to me. You had to be like, you had to perform similar to me. When no one's performed similar to him, I didn't assume he had anyone he he, com- 
he even thought as remotely close to an equal. I figured he was so pompous that he didn't even consider anyone even remotely a threat. It's it's complicated because like it, it, you kind of have to wonder because another reason why he was upset by it was because he needed Darius. He needed Darius to openly abdicate his throne and give it to Alexander. That was his last chance. And so you kind of have to wonder like how much of it was was Alexander the king and how much of it was Alexander the human uh, who was what how much of it was just being upset that his political bargaining chip was gone and how much of it was uh was he was genuinely upset at the way that he had died what whatever the case he ordered the persian king's body to be returned to the now burned out ruins of persepolis and uh darius would become the last achaemenid king to be buried in persepolis so now for the millionth time in his life alexander was in a bad situation Darius was dead. He didn't have anybody to abdicate the throne to him. And on top of that, now his chief enemy was Bessus, who was, in all honesty, both a better commander than Darius and also had the complete loyalty of the Eastern satrapies. So every every uh, part of the Persian Empire that was east of Persia, completely loyal to Bessus. That's quite surprising, did even Darius have that level of support? Um, he did, just by virtue of being the Persian king. But Beth, once Bessus claimed the throne, everybody in the Eastern satrapies knew Bessus personally, and so and knew what a capable he leader he was. How was it possible with uh, the um, the level of transport back then? Did he travel before he became, and they just knew him beforehand? Yeah. Yeah, like he was already a satrap before all of this happened, and he uh, communicated and uh, had a lot of personal dealings with other satraps in the eastern part of the empire. So what it was, it was like um, a political figure who already knew a bunch of people in the region just stepping up to the next level after a tragic event? Right, basically, yeah. Okay. So yeah, he already had personal relationships with all of the Eastern satraps. They all had complete faith in his ability. And so he had a solid grasp on the loyalty of the Eastern satrapies. So Alexander decided that his only course of action was to switch roles. Um, so he decided... How, so? How does he switch roles? Um, he decided to go from being Darius's conqueror to Darius's heir and avenger. How does he pull that off? Because it was very evident that he was opposed to Darius. Did that actually work? Or was that just a narrative he was trying to spin? It, uh, it's, it, propaganda is weird. Prop it, it's, it's 1984 stuff. You can convince somebody to forget about something they knew as fact 10 minutes ago by telling them a new fact that contradicts it. Based on what you know as someone who is very new to the Tropic, how do you think it was? Do you think they actually believed that, or do you think it was just propaganda? It it depends on the person. It From person to person, it might be they recognized the political uh, the political advantage of convincing like the general like keep in mind that alexander wasn't trying to convince like the general persian population he was trying trying to convince specifically the nobility okay and so from person to person within the persian nobility um they could either like just be dumb enough to believe it or they could be smart enough to recognize that the people who are dumb enough to believe it will believe it so again based on your own opinion obviously we're not experts which do you think was more prevalent? Um, probably just that people saw it as a political expedient. That's kind of what I would figure. It's pretty easy to see through from a modern context, but I wasn't sure from a like historical context. Yeah, it's really complicated, and there's a lot of nuance to it that's been lost through history. I'm sure. Because a lot of the people, even the most intelligent uh, Pers of the Persian nobles, even the most, like, like ruthless political players to some extent were still like religiously and spiritually minded. And that's really what the claim to the Persian throne was. You, it represented the, the Persian 
king, the Shan Shah, the king of kings, represented Ahura Mazda's representative on earth. That's really who they were. They were the they were somebody who was appointed by Ahura Mazda to rule the peoples of the earth. And to some extent, even every single Persian noble believed that to some extent. Um, but they were they were willing to believe things or to pretend that they believe things to a certain extent for their own political expediency, if that makes sense. I would argue even that is today. You can fool yourself into believing a political position that favors you, even if it's really not likely to succeed. Oh, yeah. That's I mean, that's just modern politics now. It's tricking yourself into believing something absurd because it benefits you. That's that's essentially what modern politics is, politics is like, and to some extent, that's always kind of existed. Yeah, he switched roles, um, and he was using this excuse of avenging Darius to hunt down Bessus and quote unquote bring him to justice. If he could bring down Bessus, if he could bring Bessus back to Persia in chains and put him on trial for regicide, then maybe, just maybe, he could leverage that to gain legitimacy in the eyes of the Persian nobles. That doesn't feel very likely to me. Like, yes, just maybe. But you're relying very heavily on something that you can't guarantee in the first place. Um, yeah, but it was as a, as much of a long shot as it was, was. It was the only choice that Alexander had. He did. He had no other choice. He had burned every other bridge, literally, when he burned down Persepolis. So he decided that he would chase after Bessus, and that decision was the beginning of the end for Alexander. It very much sounds like it, because from everything I get, anything after he made it into Persia, it was just his icing, so so to speak, and he should have just been happy with that, and he should have just called it good, to be honest. Um. To some extent, there's some wisdom in trying to chase down Bessus. I mean, it's it's the standard playbook whenever you gain, whenever you uh, come to uh, gain the throne of a country, you the first thing you do is immediately take out all pretenders to the court. Very obviously. But I feel like Alexander was being too active. He should have been on the defense from this point on, not on the offense. He was seeking it out. He was, for, this is, I, I don't mean literally, I mean from just the narr- narrative perspective, that he was always looking for a fight, is what it seems like. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. He was a very, that's what he's known for, is he was a very, very aggressive person in everything that he did. Um, he was never on the defense. That just wasn't who he was. It's never anything that he ever did, whether it was to his detriment or not. Often he was a good enough commander and a good enough politician that it often worked out for him. But you're going to see it not work out for him a lot very soon. You can only go so far, in my opinion, with the way Alexander did before you run out of luck. Alexander very much is someone that if you believe in a god of luck or if you believe in a god was blessed by them because there's no way anything he does happens without some kind of divining force unless we're just talking absolute random equivalency and he just somehow played the numbers yeah um after this point alexander's troops they really didn't they were done they didn't want to play ball anymore as they saw it darius was dead persia was conquered it was time to go back to Macedon. That was their assumption. That's what they assumed was going to happen next. One morning, Alexander actually woke up. He walked out of his tent and he saw all of his troops starting to pack up and get ready to leave to go back to Macedon. He started asking people like, why are we packing up? I haven't ordered people to pack up. And they're like, well, we're we're done. We're going back to Macedon. That's, like, that's obvious, isn't it? And of course, that it was way past time, too. Like, Alexander, even he should have realized, hey, I can only keep these people for so long. We need to, there needs to be a time and a place, you know? Um, Yeah, and this this scared the shit out of Alexander. Because, of course, he wasn't done conquering. 
his his plan was just to keep conquering until the day he died. Um, so he scared them. So he had to get them back on board some way, and he did that by scaring them. How did he scare them? So he gave them a speech where he basically said, if we turn back now, then all of our conquests will fall and we'll all be killed. If we if we turn back now... Oh, play the scare tactics card, sure. After we just absolutely decimated everything. You go home, and if they try and encroach again, you still have most of everyone you had before. You can easily rile it back up and just quell the oncoming. It's not going to be that hard. Yeah, um, but it worked. And they got back into line. So next, was it? Did everyone get back in line, or were there some deserters? No, his whole army got back in. Um, I feel that that's another uh, historical overview, like oversimplification. There had to have been a few people that left over that. I still feel. I mean, I mean, I'm sure at this point there were going to be a, a stray deserter or two, but. At this point, um, you got to remember like group dynamics. Like if one person or if like the majority of a group. I very much understand that. Hey, I don't want to do this. But hey, if my buddy and my buddy's buddy say they'll do it, I might just say, what the hell? Yeah, that's that's what I'm guessing is pretty much happening here. Like nobody wants to do this, but everybody is agreeing to it anyway. So I'm figuring it's just like. Like. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Um, yeah, I, I totally get it. Like, well, yes, there was a bunch of people that probably didn't agree with Alexander. The amount of people that finally decided enough is enough was so limited that it's negligible to history. Yeah. Um, so next they set out. They set out again after Bessus. They passed through the region of uh, Hyrcania and accepted the surrender of the city. The surrender of the city of Zadricarta. One of the Persian nobles there was Nabarzanes, uh, was a guy named Nabarzanes, who was Darius's, I guess, the closest equivalent would be like a prime minister. So he was kind of like the second in control of Darius's government. And he had actually been the second guy behind Bessus in uh, Darius's overthrow and his murder. So he'd been there and he'd been complicit in all of that. So in exchange for Nabarzani's life, Alexander um, Alexander um, a- agreed to spare him. And in exchange, uh, he this is a really weird story. Um, Nabarzani's gave Alexander a eunuch boy who was a slave. Was this the equivalent of just sending over a sex slave? This literally, yeah, he was literally a sex slave. Um, he was a he was. That's what I was feeling like it was, but. I still feel uncomfortable with the idea. Yeah, he was a young teenage boy. His name was Bagoas. And he had been Darius's... The, the, the sources referred to him as a lover. There's no way it was a laver. It, it, it had to have been a sex slave. Yeah, he was a sex slave. <laughs> Alexander was immediately spitten, smitten with Bagoas. And ended up taking him as a lover, too. And that, that was yet another thing that kind of started driving a wedge between Alexander and his men. And that was like, his men started to think that Alexander was starting to, the the phrase is like, go native. And because to this point, like, like I've mentioned to present himself as like a proper Persian King, he'd started to adopt a lot of Persian customs, started to wear Persian clothes, Persian rituals in his court. And, at this point, he was also starting to appoint a lot of Persian nobles into key positions in his army. That was a big development. Um, so now... How did... Obviously, without spoiling it, did that work out for him? Did it... I can't imagine that being very smart, even if you pick the safest person to pick. Uh, define work out. They didn't immediately betray him. No, all of the people that he appointed were complete opportunists. They had fully uh, put all of their bets on Alexander, and they were now ride or die with Alexander to the very end. Because if, at this point, if if Bess, 
How many of those that he appointed made it out after Alexander's downfall? It's hard to say. We we don't. The biography I read doesn't really talk about a lot of them, um, and I don't think the sources really like talk about what happened to a lot of them either. I would as well because they don't matter in historical context. No one cares about the little people that got appointed afterwards. Um, the best that I can assume is because like. After Alexander's death, not up until Alexander's death, they played a major role in his administration and in his military, all of these per- new Persian nobles he was bringing in. And so I would assume that a lot of them just kind of got transferred over into um, the successor kingdom that controlled Persia after that, um, which was the Seleucid Empire. How many of them, like, so how many of them, like, do we know that went down with the ship? Did any of them? I have no idea. I could not. Um, because because they staked all of... They staked their livelihoods onto Alexander, and Alexander ended up winning. Like, yeah, there's... But from this... Like, there's not... Alexander's going to have a downfall, but his empire isn't... Like, even when his empire fractures after his death, it doesn't mean that the Persians come back. The Persians are still controlled by Greeks after he dies. And so they... Oh, really? I assumed once he died, it kind of all segmented it again. Yeah, it it all splits apart, but it splits apart between his generals. Oh, interesting. So it's still Greeks... Yeah, it's still Greeks that control all of it after he dies. And so they're still, like... As long as they, like, once Alexander, like, they're going to stick with Alexander till he dies. And then once he dies, as long as they give their loyalty to the next guy, who in this case is going to end up being one of Alexander's minor subcommanders named uh, Seleucus. Um, As long as they give their loyalty to Seleucus, uh, they can keep going. Um, Yeah, so it, it doesn't really, none of them really play a major role in the story. And... So we don't really know specifics for any of them. And they're at this point, they're all like minor figures. There's no, like all of his major sub commanders, all of his leading generals are all still Macedonians. Cheers for old eggs, Alexander. Uh, so that, but still that, that wedge was still going deeper and deeper between him and his army. It was also about this time uh, that Alexander started his his drinking problem really started to become a problem. Um, so sip, yeah. Now now we're gonna start getting into like the name, the actual spiritual namesake of the podcast. Next, the army moved to the city of Susia, which is very confusingly named. It's not it's Susia, not Susa, like the last the one of the other cities we were just at, um, which was the capital of the region of Araya. Uh, the satrap there had initially surrendered to Alexander, but then after his army left, uh, he rose up in a revolt behind Alexander's army. And so Alexander had to quickly turn his army back around and ended up chasing this rebel army into a forest. Um, and instead of trying to fight, Alexander just ordered that the forest be set on fire and killed this entire army of like 15,000 people. Yeah, it's the easy way. I also sip. Oh, gee, good God. That that deserves a second sip. That was the last little bit of his story before we get into Bactria. And if anybody who's familiar with Alexander is listening right now, they know exactly what's coming next. The camp, Alexander's campaign in Bactria is easily the darkest chapter of his entire story. It's not the tail end, but it is like some of the saddest, like when we see Alexander at his lowest. Um, So it starts on a dark note. um, Just as he's setting off on the campaign in Bactria, uh, he decides to go ahead and liquidate Parmenio, get Parmenio out of the picture permanently. I thought he already got rid of Parmenio. Um, so he had left Parmenio behind, which means he wasn't an immediate threat. 
but he still had Parmenio's sons. Yeah, you mentioned that he still had some of Parmenio's people. Yeah, so Parmenio still had influence. He wasn't as powerful as he had been before, but he was still powerful um, because he had his sons and several of his several people that were loyal to him still within the military. And so Alexander decided to deal with that once and for all. So did he kick him? Did he kill him? What did he do? Um, so it started with Parmenio's son, Philotus, who was actually the commander of the companion cavalry. So this cavalry that Alexander had been taking along with him and all of his biggest moments, the commander that was alongside him was the, was Parmenio's son, Philotus. A rumor had reached Alexander that there was a coup attempt that was being plotted. And Philotus had been informed about the plot attempt, but had not told Alexander for two days after. How realistic is this story? Like, did he actually wait two days or was this just like propaganda used against him? He did actually wait two days. The reason he waited two days was because he didn't take the threat seriously. He didn't think it was real, which in all honesty, I'm not convinced it was actually real. I don't think there was an actual plot attempt, but that delay in telling Alexander was the justification that he needed to implicate Philotus in a coup attempt scheme. So he ordered Philotus to be captured and they tortured him. And through the course of his torture, they forced him to implicate his father, Parmenio. And then... Uh, so this was just Alexander getting an entire, like, basically building a case against someone he already hated that he already got rid of. He wanted to put the nails in the coffin, essentially. Yes. Yeah, this was this was essentially a purge. Um, so they tortured Philotus, they forced Philotus to implicate his father, and then they executed Philotus in a show trial. Um, a couple weeks later, a death warrant arrived in Ecbatana uh, to the garrison in, in the city, and the garrison commander organized the assassination of Parmenio, and Parmenio was killed. No hiccups, no nothing? I feel like that's the perfect time historically for a hiccup to happen. Yeah, it would have been the perfect time, but it went off with that hitch. He got he got Parmenio out of the way just like that. That's lucky. <sighs> yeah. Um, in Philotus's place, Alexander split command of the companion cavalry between Hephaestion, uh, who is his best buddy, and I haven't mentioned up to this point, and I'll get into it more in the next episode. But Hephaestion was probably also his lover. Was this just a casual fling kind of lover? Or was this like a serious lover? They had probably been lovers this entire time. Yes, but was Alexander using him out of convenience? Or do you think it was an actual romantic? No, they were, genu no, they were genuinely close. Like, for, for millennia, historians had referred, like, had recognized that they were the so they were quote unquote roommates. Yes. Yes, that's um uh I haven't mentioned it up to this point because I didn't know very much about it because it wasn't mentioned in the biography that I read for research on this topic. Because that biography was written in the seventies before that was a thing you could talk about in academia. That that's one of my big complaints about academia is they are quick, very quick to dismiss people who lived together for very long periods of time as just quote unquote roommates. And that's why we've created this whole joke of they were roommates. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll, I've been doing a little bit of separate research on that. And I'll get a little bit into more into it in the next episode. Um, but he split Alexander split command of the companion cavalry between Hephaestion and, and that guy I mentioned back in at the Battle of the Granicus, Clytus the Black. You remember him? He was the guy that saved Alexander's life at the battle. Vaguely. Yeah, so he's he's this is his moment. I mentioned back then that to remember his name because he was gonna come up again. This is when he comes back up again. Uh so also this was Hephaestion's first major role as a field commander. Now he was one of the co-commanders of the 
companion cavalry. His his historians like like the sources claim that he was fine. He was a fine commander. He wasn't special. He did okay. I just thought I'd throw that out there. Um, so the army arrived in what is now modern day Kandahar in Afghanistan in February of 329 BCE, and they crossed the Hindu Kush mountains into the region that was referred to as Bactria. Almost immediately, the Thessalian cavalry mutinied. Can you really blame them? <laughs> this is this is a really big deal. Uh, there's a lot of big events coming at coming at us really quickly. Um, so yeah, the the Thessalian cavalry had been under the command of Parmenio for this entire campaign, and when they found out about what had happened to Parmenio, uh, they finally decided they'd had enough of Alexander, as one would after that kind of level of loyalty. Yeah. Um, uh, at this point, like he was far away from any of his cities where he could like conceive a, he didn't really have like a, a way to force them to stay because no matter how much money he offered to pay them, they just wouldn't because they hated Alexander. Now they refused to go forward. And so he, he had shot himself in the foot. And so now he didn't have any options, so he just released them from service and allowed them from, to go home. Um, shortly after that, they kept heading deeper into Bactria through... I mean, you know how, like, Afghanistan is. It's a bunch of, like, dry hills, basically. Um, which can either be, like extremely like desert hot or freezing cold depending on the time of the year yep so right now it was desert hot and after crossing a lot of this area um, they arrived at a river and uh, all of a bunch of his troops immediately rushed to the river to get a drink of water because they were all dehydrated Hundreds, I, I'm not kidding here, hundreds of his troops died from over-drinking water. Did they over-hydrate? Did they... they... They just hydrated too quickly, sent their bodies into the shock, and they keeled over and died. That makes much more sense. I was thinking like, oh, we just drank too much. I didn't think about shock. Yeah, it's just... Yeah, the shock in their bodies from being underhydrated to suddenly being super overhydrated. Literally, I hundreds. I mean, this crippled his army. Uh, also, sip. As it would definitely be. So at this point, because he'd lost so many troops between the Thessalians and a bunch of his troops dying from overhydrating, uh, he became really short on manpower. And so he was forced to hire a bunch of local troops like a local Bactrian troops to supplement his army. I can't imagine that going well for him. Um, it, they ended up being so, like really good troops. They were really effective in future battles. I was talking specifically loyalty wise. They feel like they would be the quickest to be like, ah, fuck this. I'm running. No, cause they were getting paid. They're getting paid really well. Um, um, the real problem came with, uh, well, uh, his own Macedonian troops were like, well, now now, he, now he's not only acting like an Easterner, uh, he's bringing even more Easterners to replace us into our army. It makes total sense from a soldier's perspective. Yeah, he's slowly becoming the enemy. He He's trying, whether or not they realize it, whether they see, oh, he's just trying to assimilate their values, they're like, oh, they're corrupting him. We need to stop him before he becomes too corrupted. Yeah, that's that's essentially what's happening here. So that this happened, all of this happened at the Oxus River. Um, and after all, after bringing on the new troops, he pushed his army north past the Oxus River, continuing his pursuit of Bessus into a region called Sogdiana. And Sogdiana was the region that's north of Afghanistan. If you see, if you look at a map, it's. Um, all of all the reason all the regions like just north of all the countries just north of Afghanistan like uh uh 
I can't remember any of the names right now. I'm getting, I'm a little too tipsy to remember any of them now. Um, I couldn't tell you even when I'm sober. But <laughs> but it's all like uh, like Central Asian step. So it's like uh, um, like wide open fields and plains. I get what you're laying down. There he reorganized his troops and he planned to uh, Bessus reorganized his troops uh, north of the Oxus River and he planned to attack the Macedonians as they tried to cross the river. The thing is, he didn't anticipate that Alexander would be able to get his troops across the river so quickly. Alexander only got, it only took him five days to get his entire army across the river. That's impressive, even by modern standards. I'm going to be perfectly honest. Yeah, keep in mind he had a he had an army of like forty to fifty thousand people. Again, still impressive by modern standards because without modern technology, so say if you tried to take a modern troop with even modern tactics and tried to cross that, it would be nigh impossible if you're using the technology available back then. Yeah, and it's just another testament to like the logistical ability that Alexander had. So Alexander got his entire army across the river before Bessus even had a chance to attack. Um, so at this point, uh, Bessus was kind of losing. So first he had fled from Bactria uh, and not confronted Alexander back, back in, down in Bactria proper. And that had kind of, kind of lowered his, uh, lowered his clout with his sub commanders, who were all like, who were all from like uh, this region that they were in now. It's called Sogdiana, and they were all like nomadic horse people. Um, and then after this this debacle at the Oxus River, where Bessus failed to attack them while they were crossing the river. Um, like when I tell you this came out of left field when I was reading the biography, um, Bessus was overthrown. Interesting. So yeah, Bessus was uh, captured by one of his sub commanders, a Sogdi, a Sogdian noble named Spitomenes. Honestly, at this point, I expected him to start his losing streak. Yeah, um, Spitomenes is going to be the greatest threat that Alexander ever faced since Memnon. He's going to be to Alexander what Memnon was at the beginning of the story. So Spitomenes captured uh, Bessus and left him literally tied up completely naked to a post on the side of the road for, um, for Alexander to come across. Came across Bessus and captured him and sent him back to the city of Zariaspa, um, which was just a smaller city back in Persia. Or actually, it was back in... Um, oh, I can't remember exactly where it was. I'm too drunk now. Um, but he sent it back, and Bessus stood trial for a regicide. Uh, he was found guilty a year later at his trial, and he had his ears and his nose cut off, and then he was publicly executed. So, except why was Bessus accused of regicide? Because uh, he had killed Darius. Okay, that makes much more sense. Um, yeah, so that's that's Bessus, who really should have been a bigger part of the story, but wasn't because of Spitomenes. Um, but that was him out of the way. Uh, Alexander thought that since Spitomenes had surrendered Bessus up, that they were now friends. You know, well, Spitomenes gave me Bessus, so now we're friends, and Spitomenes is on my side. And so he just completely ignored Spitomenes. That was a grave mistake, I'm guessing. Oh, it was one of the worst mistakes of his career. Um, so he took his army further north into Sogdiana. He found a line of forts that was supposed, supposedly built by Cyrus the Great. Um, this uh, this area, Sogdiana, is the furthest northeast corner of the Persian Empire. And it was also the place where Cyrus the Great was killed in battle. 
beyond this line of forts, there were like seven forts, which marks the border between Sogdiana and the rest of the Central Asian steppe. Um, and that cent- Central Asian steppe was home to a bunch of nomadic tribes um, that were actually friends with Spatomenes, uh, who was, you know, kind of the de facto satrap of Sogdiana. So Alexander went in and he started signing declarations of friendship with some of these tribes who were kind of just like biding their time until uh, Spatomenes could strike. Basically, they were bluffing, is what, right? Yeah, they were bluffing. Um, and so while they were doing that, Spatomenes popped back up with his enormous cavalry force and swept through all of these forts where Alexander had set up garrisons, captured all of the forts and slaughtered all of the Macedonian garrisons inside. So sip. So Alexander immediately jumped into action. Um, he sent part of his force. So after... so. Uh, Spitomenes had split his forces into two. Part of one half of his forces had captured uh, the forts. The other half were assaulting um, the city of Maraconda, which was one of the cap one of the major cities of Bactria. Um, and Spitom, so half of his force were the forts. The other half were besieging Maraconda. Alexander sent part of his force down to Maraconda to try and uh, relieve the city. Uh, that force was, it was a force of like 6,000 troops. Um, they were immediately surrounded. Um, they were, or they were tricked into following Spatomenes' forces into the steps, were surrounded and completely killed to a man. This was the largest... Um, the largest single force of Alexander's army that he had lost up to this point. That's crazy that it took this long in his career to have a mm, defeat that was that significant that it has to be marked this late in his career. So while that was happening, um, Alexander was leading his own forces and re retook all of those forts um, and in the process of capturing these forts and slaughtering all of the uh, the Sogdians inside, he got two pretty major wounds. Um, the first thing was he was shot through the thigh with an arrow, which shattered his thigh bone. Oh, goodness. That was a really good hit on him. Yeah. Um, for about six months during the earth, during the following couple of weeks, he refused. He kept trying to get up out of his seat or out of his sick bed and try to walk around. Um, and because he, so you're saying this is when reality probably should have hit him and realized he's not a fucking god. Yeah, it should have, but it didn't. He kept trying to get up out of his sick bed and walking, and always, every single time, he immediately collapsed back into bed. And because he kept aggravating his wound, parts of his leg bone kept like getting pushed up to the surface and popping out of his skin. Oh, good God, that sounds disgusting. Yeah, it it took him six, about half a year to recover from this. It makes total sense if he didn't take time to fucking recover. Yeah, and then right after this, um, while literally like the next fort after this, they captured one fort and then they moved on to the next fort. The next fort after this, he was struck in the face with a rock that somebody had thrown and it gave him a concussion and almost blinded him permanently. Oh damn. They hit him really good. Yeah. He was messed up really bad by this, this whole experience. Like it, and it wasn't just his eyes either. Like he, he was blind for the rest of the day after he had gotten hit by that rock, but it had also damaged his throat. He couldn't talk for a couple days after that. I feel like that was just karma. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not losing sleep over it. I would never lose sleep over Alexander getting injured. Yeah. So he recaptured all the forts. He turned his troops back to, um, Maraconda, that city. Um, and the size of his army was a little too big for Spatomenes, and so he just took his troop, his 
uh, cavalry army back up into the steps and kind of did that classic step gnome, step horse archer thing of melting back into the steps and disappearing whenever a bigger army confronts you. So the Macedonian army went back across the river into Bactria and wintered there for the for the winter of 329 and 328. And then in the spring of 328, they returned to Sogdiana. And this time they wanted to be prepared for Spatomenes' forces. And they started building forts, which would serve to blunt Spatomenes' hit and run attacks. But the Sogdians uh, weren't playing games. And instead, they completely bypassed the entire Macedonian army, went around them, swept south into the undefended Bactria, and burned and looted all of the land around Zariaspa and massacred several of the Macedonian garrisons that were behind them. Uh, sip. Mm. Man, this is a it's a heavy drinking one. Very much so. It's also going to be an extended episode from what I feel like. Yeah. Um, one of Alexander's commanders, Craterus, um, attempted to cut Spatomenes' forces off uh, in Bactria. But once again, the Sogdians just escaped back into the steppes. Um, so at this point, the you, you have to think about what the atmosphere was like in the Macedonian camp. Um, this army was continuing a campaign that rightfully should have ended at Persepolis or at least with the capture of Bessus. Like, Bessus was captured. There was no other claim to the Persian throne at this point. There's no reason for Alexander to keep going. Other than greed. Yeah, other than just raw ambition. All of these troops and all of these generals were seeing their king become the, you know, the quote-unquote oriental tyrant of their nightmares before their very eyes. Um, and now they were in their second year of what should have been another short campaign of pacification. They shouldn't have been in Bactria for this long. Honestly, I feel like even if Alexander didn't want to stop, he should have slowed the fuck down way along, like at the be at his the events that started this episode. He should have been slowing down on his conquesting because. You have to think about how your your uh, troops are going to feel about something, and you got to worry about morale. And I feel like morale would have significantly dipped with the way he's doing it. Yeah, that's the thing, though he he had nothing. I think this is something that's underplayed in like his biographies. He had nothing but contempt for his own troops. He thought that his troops were a bunch of rubes that can be bought off to go as far as he wanted them to. As long as he had enough money, he could keep them going for whatever he wanted them for. Even if they're rubes, they are his main source of power. He needs to keep them in line. He needs to at least think, hey, I need to be prepared if they decide I am not the one anymore. I need to make sure that I'm following at least somewhat guidance that they would like. Uh, but that's, that's just the problem with people who have that much power is they don't they can't possibly put themselves in somebody else's shoes it's just not like it's not compatible with the way they view the world the idea of like understanding how somebody else feels about a situation yeah so on top of the fact that this campaign should have been done like half a year ago they had already suffered two devastating defeats at the hands of Spitamines. Like they were doing worse in the last year of fighting than they had done in the previous six or seven. It makes total sense. I feel like a lot of his troops are losing morale at this point, even if they're being paid. And at this point, I feel like Alexander is kind of losing himself. He's getting high and cocky. So he doesn't have as big as of a plan at this point. Oh, you you have no idea how how cocky and how high and mighty he is. He exactly is at this moment. Yeah. So 
it all began with a banquet in honor of Clytus the Black, who Alexander had just appointed to be the satrap of Bactria, so the governor of the entirety of Bactria. As was tradition in at Macedonian parties celebrating these kinds of things, everyone got insanely drunk and sip. Um, and as was common at this time, Alexander was now surrounded by bootlickers who were boasting loudly about what amazing feats Alexander had accomplished and how godlike he was, comparing him. There's no way he doesn't surround himself with bootlickers at this point. He's willed down his army to the point it's only the people who really want to be there. And at this point, he's really just trying to stroke his own ego. Yeah. At this point, he is a stereotypical dictator. And in the next couple paragraphs, I'm going to explain just like the first example of how dictatorial he has become. So he's so all of these bootlickers that are around him are calling him tell, talking about how godlike he is, uh, comparing him to Achilles and Hercules, and they're trying to stroke his ego. Clytus, who has been, you know, he's part of Philip's old guard. Uh, he's be, he's absolutely disgusted by what Alexander is doing, by how he's adopted all of these Persian customs and how much of a despot he's become. And he responded to them by to all of these bootlickers by saying that Alexander didn't actually do that much, and that it was actually his army and the legacy of Philip that had made all of these conquests possible. And so the so Alexander and Clytus got into an argument. Alexander called him a coward and blamed him for the defeats in Sogdiana, and Clytus accused Alexander of allowing Macedonians to become slaves to barbarians. Um, he was accusing Alexander of basically letting, letting Persians take over uh, the Macedonian throne or the Macedonian court and that Mac Macedonians would not be second-class citizens to these Persians that Alexander preferred. I mean, it's the perfect, uh, like, it's the perfect rhetoric for them to be like, Hey, Alexander is just buying into this Persian ideology. We we really shouldn't be following him at this point. Yeah. Also, um, when Alexander called Clytus a coward, uh, Clytus responded by saying, "Was it cowardly when I saved your life at the Granicus?" Shots fired. Yeah, that pissed off Alexander. Alexander threw an apple at him. For completely randomly just had an apple threw it at him uh the fight got physical they started getting at each other they had to be pulled apart um and as Clytus was as they were trying to drag Clytus out of this tent um he stepped back in and when he stepped out into or as he was as they were trying to pull Clytus out of the tent um he yelled out um a line from a poet called Euripides. Uh, I, if I remember correctly, the quote was, um, oh, what government there is in Hellas or something like that. Um, and it was, it was a line from a poem or from a play that was about how all of Greece had been taken over by governments that, um, that would send their armies out into battle to fight and kill each other for no reason. And then the, the old men, the old rich men who controlled these governments would take credit for all of these achievements. You mean how our political system works today? You mean how every political system works? <laughs> um, but yeah, he was basically accusing Alexander of taking the credit for the great feats of his army. And Alexander would understood the reference to this poem because they had they had both learned these poems as children um and so alexander was so filled with rage that he broke free from all of the men who were trying to hold him back 
he took a spear from one of his bodyguards and he stabbed Clytus in the chest. I mean, at that point, do you really blame X Alexander? Yeah, I do, actually. <laughs> do explain. He got shit talked and he blew up. Uh, he got shit talked because uh, becoming a dictator. I mean, you're right. He was being shit talked because he was turning his back on everything his army believed, his army and his his generals, like his people, believed in. Um, he was he was being motivated completely by ambition. He was driving this army in deep into barbarian territory where they were all being killed by the thousands. Again, you're right, but Alexander was in a place of privilege. He didn't he didn't realize he was sitting from a place of privilege and just being a dictator at this point. Also, I'd like to point out Clytus is dead. It happened because they were both drinking. You know what that means? Is that another shot? That is another shot, my my, my man. I hate you, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> what is I think that's the most shots we've had in episode so far. I believe that's four shots in a single episode and the max we've gotten is two shots in an episode even from last episode being double shots so technically four. So this equals up to last episode. This when I came up with that rule for a shot whenever somebody was somebody was killed and alcohol was involved, this is actually the exact event I had in my mind when I came up with that rule. Well, I wish I had a little bit of warning that there would be this many shots in this episode. Okay, I'm telling you now, Tim, I'm never giving you warning. As long as we do this podcast, I'm never going to give you warning. Well, we better make sure I never record it on a work night again. But yeah. He, he stabbed Clytus in the chest with a spear. Killed Clytus instantly. It was the summer of 328 BCE. Alexander had just completed his transformation into what we would recognize as a dictator. This was his first real dictatorial act. This was his first. I'd argue he had many dictator-like aspects before now, but this was his first. Like, There is no if, ands, or buts. He is now a officially a dictator. Yeah, this is his first completely, like with, um, with the death of like with the killing of Parmenio, he at least had the pretense of it being, like, um, having an excuse for it. This was no excuse, just a blind rage murder of one of his own subordinates, which I'd like to point out. Like spoilers, he's never going to face repercussions for. Oh, I would have never fucking guessed. So, summer of 328, he's just completed his transformation into a dictator. He's 28 years old. The amount of time you talked about, it feels like he should be at least 29 by now, though. I got his age wrong earlier. Um, <laughs> so you're telling me he's been even younger this whole time? Yeah, he's, as of this moment, when he killed Clytus, he is 28 years old. And that's a pretty solid thing that historians can agree on is his age. Yeah, we know the year and the general, like the only deviation in when we can agree that Alexander was born was about a month, whether it was like June or July. We agree that everybody agrees on the year and the general area, the uh, general part of the year. So he was definitely 28 when this happened. That's very interesting. I'm surprised that we can get that close on age, though. Yeah. Um. So yeah, from here on out, um, it's all downhill. It's there's there's never a happy moment in Alexandra's life after this point. I would sure to God hope so. He's been on his high horse for so long. I hope he gets kicked the fuck off. Oh, he's gonna get kicked off in a real big way. <laughs> Let me tell you what. In the next episode, it's gonna be it's gonna happen. It's gonna be bad. Um. But yeah, Tim, you got any pluggables? Uh, so you can find me on Twitter at Tim, a.k.a. Otis, on Twitter. 
You can also find the podcast at the Alexander Society Pod on Facebook and Instagram and Alex Society Pod on Twitter. Where can they find you, Derek? Uh, they can find me on Twitter at Visigoth. The I is a one. The O is a zero. Um, don't try to find me on Facebook or Instagram. Um, if you do, uh, if you if you try to interact with me in any way on either of those platforms, I will block you. It's... Those are the personal ones? If they're not even personal. I just hate both of those platforms. That's fair. Um, if you find some way to find me on Snapchat, I'll just let you add me because that's really impressive. Um. That's, that's very fair. If you like the podcast or have any room for improvement, please let us know on your podcast system of choice by leaving us a review and letting us know where we can improve or what you liked. Bye.